Inverclyde's capital, Ferguson's, uh, will indeed remain an integral part uh, of the Inverclyde community. Thank you, I'm afraid that uh, concludes the time available for questions this afternoon. And we have to turn to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 11301 in the name of Liz Smith on addressing the attainment gap in Scottish schools. Could I invite members who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible? And I call on Liz Smith to speak to and move the motion up to 14 minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, the parties in this chamber uh, frequently disagree on education policy. Uh, that's no doubt partly because we have uh, different principles when it comes to underpinning our respective party manifestos, but all too often it's because we sometimes find it difficult to agree on the nature or the extent of a problem. Now, today's amendments make it clear that during today's debate we will argue again about policy. But having read uh, a great deal about what the other parties have had to say on this issue over some considerable period of time, I do not believe that any of us will have too much difficulty when it comes to acknowledging the full nature and extent of the problem. That is, when it comes to accepting the stark evidence which lays bare the differences in attainment between different schools and different communities. And for the moment, I want to deal specifically with attainment rather than with achievement. Now, if you look at the overall attainment across Scotland for the last two academic years, there has been a very small improvement as measured by the headline statistic. But this masks the true picture for far too many young people. As Ruth Davidson highlighted in her recent conference speech when she spelt out the Conservative uh, education policies, fewer than 20% of pupils from the most deprived areas were attaining five standard grade credit passes, yet 60% of their peers from the more affluent communities were managing to do so. In a number of local authorities, the chance of a pupil from a disadvantaged area attaining these qualifications, if, in a minute, if I may, uh, were attaining these qualifications, and making it four to five times less likely than the chance for a pupil from a more affluent home. Alistair Allen. Well, I think members are giving way, and I think we would all agree about the importance, the importance of closing the attainment gap. So, Can could I, I have the minister's microphone, please? Minister. Uh, well, I think we would all accept. <laughs> well, we would all accept. I think the importance of closing the attainment gap. Can I ask the, the, the member whether she would, however, uh, disassociate herself uh, from any attempts to uh, misre uh, misrepresent the nature uh, of the problem? Uh, and particularly, I'm thinking of some extraordinary comments uh, in the. Uh, mail on Sunday this week where the claim was made that 20% of our pupils are in a school where they have literally no chance whatsoever to go into either tertiary education, skills training or any kind of productive activity. Uh, I hope she will either, um, either name these schools or disassociate, or disassociate herself from such a claim. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you. No, I completely disassociate myself. I didn't say that. But I didn't say that, Cabinet Secretary. Well, that's fair. Uh, the newspaper to answer, but I did not say that. And you will know from my speech uh, to follow that I dissociate myself completely from that, as I do from uh, several other uh, bland statements that I don't think go to the root of this uh, problem. And so can I get back to the fact that I think that the attainment gap, and indeed it's mentioned in uh, the uh, Labour amendment, uh, is very important when it comes to uh, the earliest possible years. And it, so it can be absolutely no surprise by, by the time the pupils uh, come to study for their higher grades, only one in 10 will attain at least three A grades. And worse still is the fact that only 2.9% of these disadvantaged pupils attain those grades, whereas 20% of those from the better off families manage to do so. And so that means that you're seven times more likely to do well in your hires if you're born into a more affluent family. In Edinburgh, which is supposedly one of the areas that often can boast better results, only 1.1% of pupils from the poorest 20% of households is attaining three A's or more. That is precisely six pupils. And it exposes the fact that it's not just a gap in the terms of the different local authority areas, it can actually be a gap between children who might just live a few streets apart. Now, I believe, presiding officer, that that is a bleak picture. No one, whether they are conservatives, whether they are nationalists, whether they're liberals or socialists, can deny these findings or the deep-rooted unfairness which accompanies them. 
In short, far too many of our young people are attending schools which year on year do not perform as well as they should. Now, this chamber knows only too well that I'm not a fan of too many league tables, but I do believe in the important ones. And I also believe in the ones which measure a school against its own successes or failure, since I think these often provide the greatest accuracy when it comes to making comparisons. And I recognise what the Cabinet Secretary has said in the past about self-improvement schools pathfinder, which I think can be extremely important. But I also believe in the need to be brutally honest. In March 2013, the Cabinet Secretary told BBC Radio Scotland Good Morning programme that Scotland does not have failing schools. Presiding officer, the phrase failing schools might not be fashionable or one which sits uh, easily with the educational parlance these days, which always seems to have some tendency towards mollification of a problem. But I think it's time to acknowledge that a few schools in Scotland and a few departments within some schools are failing to deliver the results that they should be. Matt McDonald. I wonder if the member would at least countenance the possibility that many of Scotland's schools, particularly those which serve deprived communities, are facing a range of external forces which are acting against some of the very strong efforts by teachers and educationalists to counterbalance those, many of which are being driven by the dogmatic agenda of her colleagues at Westminster. Liz Smith. Of course I accept that poverty is a serious problem. Who could not do that? And let's be absolutely clear about the issue that poverty delivers for some of these communities. But let's not pretend that there aren't some schools that are not delivering the results that they should be, because the statistics over a long period of time show that we are not getting as good results for some of our children as we ought to be. And the Cabinet Secretary has said in uh, his amendment that we are performing very well against uh, our international competitors. Well, we're performing quite well, but we're not doing as well as we ought to be. And if you look at the statistics that you can measure over a long period of time, it is crystal clear that we are not performing as well as we should be. And people like Keir Bloomer or Lindsay Patterson or Peter Downs, they have serious concerns because this is the very moment when we do need to deliver about competitive advantage. Why is it when we come to the measurements, whether it's pearls or Tim's or whatever it might be, why is it that the Scottish Government has decided to take us out of some of these measurements? Because they give us first-class information about how well we are doing. If I felt that the other parties in this chamber had the policies to deliver the change that will provide the benefit to these disadvantaged children, then perhaps I could take some of these interventions. But I don't, because the statistical fact of the matter is that too many schools are not delivering the results that they ought to be. Now, what do we have to do about this? Well, I think we do have to be uh, brutally honest, but I think it starts uh, with addressing the poverty issue. And I know that the Conservative Party and the Liberals have been targeted, very heavily targeted, about the problems of poverty. But today, the Scottish Government has released some information about how well the economy is starting to do. Nicola Sturgeon said just a little while ago when she was putting together the Child Poverty Strategy for Scotland, uh, our approach 2014-2017, much has changed, she said, since 2011, and the latest published figures show decreases in the numbers of children living in poverty. Today's statistics show that there has been a substantial improvement in the fall of those children in workless families. So one thing to do to ensure that we don't have as much poverty as we should, uh, sorry, as we do, is to make sure that we are targeting economic growth. We have to be in a scenario where we benefit the companies and the people who are offering these skills in a way that they can deliver jobs. And not just the highly skilled jobs, but upskilling right across the economy. And I think there's some quite positive signs about this. But yes, I fully admit that poverty is a difficult issue, but it's not something that we are going to accept is the problem for this party on this side of the chamber. I absolutely refute any suggestion that the Conservatives are comfortable with poverty. We are not, and this is why we are standing up and being brutally honest about this problem. I won't at this stage, if you don't mind. But on the, on the second issue, I think we need a complete change in structure. And I have in front of me some very interesting comments that the Cabinet Secretary himself said. He said that education is a field in which we have traditionally excelled, 
which, which in recent years, with the removal of a competitive environment and a weakening of a national as well as an individual striving for excellence, we have slipped down the ranks. He said that many commentators have noticed the success of Sweden of education vouchers and a debate about the utility in Scotland would be useful. He said the consumer would be able to choose the best facilities for their particular needs. He said choice and diversity are the hallmarks of a mature and confident society. Cabinet Secretary, this could be a Conservative Party manifesto. So why is it, why is it as Cabinet Secretary you will not be able to address some of these principles? Because we do need diversity. We do need a system that offers far greater opportunity for these youngsters. And I think just on the back of that, can I say something about the Wood Commission? Because I believe fundamentally that Sir Ian Wood is trying to deliver an awful lot of this. He does want diversity. He does want the best for every uh, child in Scotland. And he's really saying to us that for some children uh, who are not going to be uh, fully motivated in school, then there have to be other opportunities. But the real problem, the real problem in Scotland is that schools are accountable to local government and to national government. They are not as accountable as they should be to parents, to pupils and to teachers. And that's something that has to change. And Cabinet Secretary, you can't deny that that is something that you spoke about when you wrote your book, Grasping the Thistle. It is so, imp it is so important, if I may just a minute, it's so important that we take on board the ideas of diversity and choice and look around the world at the countries which have been doing well in their school education. It is those countries that have had that diversity and choice. John Mason. Uh, would the member accept that certainly in my area, when the parents were asked if they wanted more involvement in running the schools, they basically said no? Liz Smith. Uh, no, I don't accept that actually. And I'll tell you why, because I've been looking at some of the inspection reports uh, for schools uh, across uh, some of our weaker areas in Dundee, in uh, Edinburgh, in, in Perth and in Glasgow. And these uh, make very interesting reading uh, about how they have managed to turn around their attainment levels uh, as a result of uh, top class leadership of much greater engagement of parents who have actually said that they want to have greater diversity uh, within their school systems and also a back to basics uh, strategy in literacy and numeracy. And my uh, two colleagues, Margaret Mitchell and Murdo Fraser will say a bit more about that. So I think these inspection uh, reports tell a very important uh, story. But they tell the same story that people like Peter Peacock, uh, when he was Education Secretary, uh, described when he was looking at how individual head teachers and their creative diversity uh, had to be part of uh, reducing the attainment gap. But to be truly successful, I really do think that we have to change the system. The system at the present time is a one-size-fits-all system. And that, Cabinet Secretary, is something that you addressed uh, when you were uh, writing your book, because you said that the one-size-fits-all system does not work. So I'd be interested to hear when you uh, make your contribution this afternoon as to what it is that you feel has changed that will not allow uh, that policy uh, just now. Because it is about accountability. It's about how well we offer the educational experience to our young children. And I don't believe for a minute that any of us in this chamber will walk away from this problem but we must be absolutely honest about the scale of the problem, the fact that it has lasted for a long period of time, that we have, in the words of Keir Bloomer, been rather complacent and self-congratulatory about it. We have to accept that there is a significant problem for too many of our disadvantaged young people who are not getting the best opportunity to do well. So may I finish uh, on that point, because I think it is uh, the most important. We can agree, I think, I hope, on the nature and the extent of the statistics that define that attainment gap, but we will probably remain wholly divided about the policy which will fix the problem. And clearly the other parties, by the reaction this afternoon and the amendments, don't like our ideas. Well, to them I say this, where have your policies got us so far? Where is the evidence that Scotland has actually regained her world-leading place in school education? And where is the evidence that if you come from the least well-off communities, you stand as good a chance as anyone from the more affluent areas. Presiding officer, at present, that evidence doesn't exist. It's time to stand up and be counted. And this party has the courage of its convictions to take head on that problem. I move the motion in my name. Many thanks. 
Can I remind members uh, if they could please address their remarks through the chair and also let the chamber know that this debate is tight for time. I now call on Michael Russell to speak to and move Amendment 11304.3. Cabinet Secretary, maximum 10 minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am very pleased that we are having this debate because I want to reflect on the hard work that is being done by uh, teachers and pupils across Scotland in their schools. I want to reflect on the progress that they are making to close the attainment gap. I want to reflect on the success of Curriculum for Excellence, which has increased diversity, a Keir Bloomer invention, which has increased diversity, as has the devolving of powers to schools. And I want to talk about what works in Scottish education and what we should be proud of and what more we can do. We have seen progress wherever we look. Curriculum for Excellence has been extensively rolled out. It's now embedded in schools as a way we do education in Scotland. It's raised the bar in terms of attainment. This year we saw a record number of higher and advanced higher results across the system. The new national qualifications have brought deeper learning, a greater emphasis on analysis, engagement, understanding and diversity, and have represented a decisive shift for the better in Scottish education. Because against every main measure, despite what you have heard, Scotland schools are moving in the right direction. The latest PISA study reinforces our international standing. Coupled with that, we have a record high number of school leavers in positive destinations, more new refurbished schools, and the lowest teacher unemployment in the United Kingdom. Indeed, there is so much that is happening across education in early years, in primary and secondary, in colleges, in universities, in skills, in vocational education, that earlier this year we learned from the ONS, much beloved of the Tories, that Scotland is actually the most highly educated country in Europe and amongst the best educated in the world. And we are within that making substantial progress in tackling the most stubborn problem of all, that of the attainment gap, which was a yawning chasm before devolution, and it remained far too wide under the Labour Liberal Scottish Executive. But alas, presiding officer, there's one area in education which nothing changes, and that is, I am sorry to say, the relentless negativity of the Conservatives towards the tremendous work being done in our schools day in and day out. And now we hear again, no, one moment, please. I just want to make this point. Now again, we hear an approach which is going down the road of demonizing individual schools and will then, as the Tories go, go on to demonize individual teachers. And I hope no part of this chamber will join the Tories in that, please. Liz Smith. I think that's an outrageous uh, remark to make. We are not in any way demonising. In fact, we're actually praising some of the schools that have done uh, extremely uh, well. But I think, Cabinet Secretary, you have to address commentators like Keir Bloomer, like Lindsay Patterson, who are, despite some of the good things that are happening in, in Scottish education, they are quite rightly pointing to the fact that far too many of our disadvantaged youngsters do not have the same chances as our more affluent children. Cabinet Secretary to address in my speech because that is a matter in which we are all working together except the Tories. Now I'm certain that we will hear a further negative pessimistic picture from all the Tories but I have to say that Scotland's schools and Scotland's performance compares strongly when measured against international standards and it is improving in the main. Rather than dragging down our education system Perhaps Les Smith and her colleagues could do well to get mo out more into our schools and see exactly what was happening. Because Liz Smith has a, habit, no, has a habit of scaremongering. She did it in 2010 when she said that CFE would be nothing more than a curriculum for confusion. Two months later, CFE was successfully introduced into secondary schools. In February 2012, she predicted disaster over the introduction of the new exams. She demanded that the old standard grade should be retained. But the new exams went ahead this year without any significant problems. And, oh no, let's move on with, with Liz Smith. She predicted disaster Order, over please. the Commonwealth Games. Order. Subsequently, these were described by Prince Imran, the president of the Commonwealth Games Federation, as the best games ever. By any standards, Liv Smith, as a prophetess, is, has not got a great Order. track record. But I welcome, I welcome any debate on closing the attainment gap, what we are doing to create equity in education. But we cannot escape from the fact, we cannot escape from the fact that the real enemy to progress is poverty. And poverty is being exacerbated by the Westminster government. The Westminster government is attacking the poor for being poor. And that's nothing short of a disgrace. 
Now, with the powers of independence, the powers of a normal state, we could have used tax, welfare, labour market regulation. No, no, we could have used these powers to develop a solution that's right in this context. But Scotland didn't vote yes. Now we must all deal with the consequences of that decision. And one major consequence in this portfolio is how we're going to make real and sustained progress in narrowing the attainment gap. As it stands, welfare reforms at Westminster are going to make this worse. For decades, welfare's, Westminster's record has been abysmally poor. But now, the Institute for Fiscal Studies estimates an additional 50,000 Scottish children will be living in relative poverty by 2020 because of UK welfare reforms. And when housing costs are taken into account, that figure could be as high as 100,000. That's nothing less than a sustained attack on Scotland's poorest children. Now, we can't fully mitigate against it, but we'll do what we can to limit the worst impacts. And within this portfolio, we are doing just that. We recognise that the problems of poverty can't be stopped at the school gates, but our education must do more to raise attainment. Curriculum for excellence is in itself an important development for that, presiding officer. So is getting it right for every child. So is developing Scotland's young workforce. Together, they're creating the expectations and we're building on them with things like the partnership programme I shall touch on in a moment. But instead of seeking every opportunity to criticise, Liz Smith should get out there and meet the young people who are being affected by the benefits of these programmes. She should get out there and meet Rhys from Cote Bridge. In fact, she could have met him, first of all, in the video I showed at the start of the Scottish Learning Festival, which I distributed to members of the Education Committee, and you're welcome to have a copy of it. When I met him, Rhys was a primary seven pupil at St Bartholomew's. His head teacher had already been a keen adopter of the attainment improvement methodology. He'd worked one-on-one -on -one with Rhys to help him make progress. And when I asked Rhys in his school what difference that had made, he had a devastatingly simple and direct answer. I'm not afraid of my lessons anymore, he said. Rhys has now made a successful transition to St Ambrose High in Cote Bridge. He's continuing to enjoy his lessons. And closing the attainment gap is about that work that's happening now all over Scotland. One-to-one -one work with individuals like Rhys. It's about the inspirational actions of the team at Bells Hill Academy who identified meeting the local authority average for higher passes as a key objective, and then worked with individual pupils to help to get the result they needed. Help with things as simple as having somewhere to do their homework. And it's about working with parents too, as you can see in Wester Hales, where the senior management team ensures that every parent is, uh, is able to engage with the school on their own terms. That's a reality of improvement. It's about changing lives and prospects one by one in some of the most troubled and difficult areas of Scotland. It's being done right now. And we will do more and more of it. And surely this chamber should support that work and not attack it out of lack of knowledge or demonise schools. Liz Smith. Secretary, no one would deny that there is a fantastic amount of work being done in Scottish schools. And if you think that we are saying otherwise, then I'm sorry that you have so misinterpreted the situation. What we are pointing to, quite rightly, and which I believe every parent in the land wants addressed, is a situation where far too many of our youngsters do not have the same opportunities to succeed as other children. That surely is the most important thing that we can do and it's something that has not just developed it has been going on for some time we once had a fantastic reputation for uh, education in scotland we have in some sectors of can education can i hurry along please we must get back to that cabinet secretary we must uh, we your last minute we must presiding officer won't get back to it by demonizing the poor by demonizing schools by demonizing teachers we'll get back to it with the type of work we're doing now that's worthy of support not being attacked in June this year, I launched the Raising Attainment for All programme. Twelve local authorities, over 150 schools, signed up to becoming part of a learning community forensically focused on closing the equity gap. And we're going to expand that even further. We've got a nationally coordinated programme led by Education Scotland to partner schools so they can share best practice. We've got a coordinated programme of literacy and numeracy hubs. We've got the access to education funds. We've established the Scottish College... No, I'm sorry, I've got the to finish. I really am sorry. Closing. We've, got, we've established the Scottish College for Educational Leadership. It's up and running. There are a range of things happening good things happening, which we can work on together. What we're hearing this afternoon is the old story. It is to go back to the things we don't want to do. And it is trying to insist on progress that we're already making. Support that. 
Presiding officer, I don't think there's anywhere else in the UK, or indeed in Europe, that's prioritising educational attainment as much as we are, and the PISA results show it. We've got a unique curriculum, fit for the future, schools are eager for success, a system that's supporting them. I've got confidence in our schools to deliver on that programme. I move the amendment to this motion and I implore the Tories to be part of success and not try and drag it down. Thank you. I now call on Neil Bibby to speak to and move amendment 11304.2, maximum six minutes. Mr Bibby. Thank you, President Officer. I would like to start by uh, welcoming in the debate brought forward by the Scottish Conservatives this afternoon. I would say at the outset uh, that in moving our amendment that we can support the government amendment on the basis of it recognising uh, the challenges we face and we must uh, work together on, but that will not deter us from raising uh, those challenges in this debate. And I know Liz Smith has raised a number of challenges for the government uh, this afternoon. Addressing the educational attainment gap and educational inequality is one of the biggest issues facing this parliament and this country. This is an opportunity for us to put forward uh, suggestions as well as scrutinising the statistics, the research and also uh, the government's record since 2007. But before proposing the solutions, we need to analyse and identify the problems because there is a huge amount of work to be done to address the attainment gap in our education system and the inequality that it creates. As Liz Smith uh, said, the statistics show there has been a small reduction in the attainment uh, gap of pupils from the least and most deprived areas, uh, but none of us can claim that there has been a significant or meaningful reduction in that gap. There is still a substantial attainment gap between pupils in terms of average tariff score, positive follow-up destinations and in literacy and numeracy levels. Scottish Labour agrees that there needs to be a focus on the early years and on literacy and numeracy. We believe that it is something that all parties should prioritise and that all parents can support. The 2013 Scottish Survey of Literacy and Numeracy showed that there is a substantial gap when it comes to literacy. And the most recent 2014 reports focused on uh, numeracy were only highlighted that numeracy rates uh, were lower than compared to 2011 for primary four and primary seven pupils. However, the inequality of opportunity is no more demonstrated than when it comes to uh, statistics relating to looked after children. Most recent government uh, research showed only 2% of looked after children initially went to university compared to 36% of all school leavers. I do not pretend this is an easy problem to fix. Improvements uh, to aftercare support were made in the uh, Children and Young People Bill, but we also need to improve the standards of support that looked after children can expect during their school education. I'll give way. Yep. Uh, John Mason. I, I thank the member for giving way. I'm interested in his point about looked after children. I mean, I wonder if you would agree with me that that suggests that there's a lot of problems out with the schools that are coming into the schools that the schools need to deal with, rather than are necessarily being caused by the schools, as the Conservatives seem to suggest. Neil Bibby. Well, I think, it's a, I, think it's a, I think it's a mixture of both. I would definitely accept your, your, your point there. And for our part, the Scottish Labour Party is developing a strategy to deal with the attainment gap that includes reducing uh, the gap before children start school through uh, provision, uh, uh, increasing and improved preschool provision, removing barriers to young people's opportunities uh, and learning at school, and supporting families uh, directly through initiatives like family centres. In May this year, Scottish Labour published our Mind the Gap Challenge paper, which set out 12 policy priorities in this area, uh, including focusing on crucial early years of a child's life, building relationships between family, schools and communities, expanding wraparound care and removing barriers to inclusion, such as the cost of school trips and after school activities. The early years is a key focus of our work, but we also need to examine if our primary and secondary school education system is well enough equipped and resourced to face that huge challenge of closing the attainment gap. Despite the hard work and professional commitment of teachers, parents and pupils, the Scottish education system is being stretched, and that is uh, through no fault of teachers, parents and pupils. But we all know teachers in Scotland are facing significant workload issues at this moment in time. And surveys by teaching unions indicate the government is failing to address those workload issues. Not only are teachers are still teaching new courses and preparing pupils for new exams, there are also far fewer teachers in our classrooms. How can we seriously reduce the attainment gap given these circumstances? Since 2007, under this SNP government, we have seen a cut of over nearly 4,000 teachers. 
And this matters because teachers and parents regularly tell me and others that they feel more time teachers can spend individually with pupils, the better. At the Education Committee recently, uh, the Cabinet Secretary, in response to teaching unions' concerns, said, as for teacher numbers, I am very keen to maintain and, if possible, to expand them. Yet, just two days later in the budget, there was no mention from John Swinney in his statements of resources for maintaining, let alone increasing, teacher numbers, and I hope this will soon be addressed. The number of teachers is one issue, but the issue of inequalities is also linked to the increased reliance on private tuition. In March this year, a Holyrood magazine survey exposed that there had been a 300 per cent increase in the use of private tutors in the past year alone, 95 per cent of which come from state schools. Some families worried about their children passing their exams were found to be spending £1,900 a year to get an hour a week of extra tuition. Parents have to do what is right uh, for their children, but it is concerning that we are seeing such an increased reliance on private tuition. Families from the most deprived areas can't afford anywhere near £1,900 a year for private tuition. If this trend continues, this is only going to entrench and widen the attainment gap. And I hope the Scottish Government uh, can look at this issue and respond specifically on that point. Another issue of inequality in our present education system must come to close. Uh, that has been highlighted this week, and I'm sorry I've not got time to talk about it, is the issue of charges over exam appeals. Uh, the judgment on appeals should be based on the opinion of teachers and relevant teachers and not on the pupils or schools' um, ability to pay. And the Scottish Government should urgently review uh, what, what is happening there. I hope the Minister and the Cabinet Secretary will uh, address these issues today. There are, of course, many other challenges which Liz Smith and others uh, will, will raise, uh, and I hope we will get to discuss them uh, in this debate. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. I now turn to the open debate. There is no time available. George Adam to be followed by Jane Baxter. Thank you, President Officer, and I welcome this debate because I want to talk about some of the many positive things that are, being, are happening throughout the country within education. I agree that we must do all we can to bridge the attainment gap to ensure our young people can achieve their full potential. It is also true that, as the Conservative motion says, the greatest challenge facing Scottish education is the existence of the significant pupil attainment gap between different schools and different communities. But I have to ask myself, President Officer, where have the Tories been for the past couple of years? Because the Tory arguments are far too simplistic. The issue is larger than that. Poverty is a key part of the challenges that we have in this issue. And the current Tory welfare reforms aren't helping families throughout Scotland with this. And this motion saying that they would give a school head teacher full control of a devolved budget may do a lot of things, but it won't do much to alleviate poverty in our communities. But in the real world, the Scottish Government has ensured that there are a record number of school leavers in work, training and education. The Scottish Government ensures a strong commitment to driving improvement, ensuring equality and attainment, to ensure that all young people achieve their full potential. Performance is approved against all ten of the attainment measures the Accounts Commission examined over the last decade. And as, the as the Cabinet Secretary has already said, OECD's PISA study shows that Scotland is narrowing the attainment gap, unlike the rest of the United Kingdom. While the Scottish Government are making progress in reducing the attainment gap, they can go only go so far in mitigating the damage caused by Westminster's policies. Yes, well, at the stage. Liz Smith. Could I have Liz Smith's Sorry. microphone? I just quote what Nicola Sturgeon said, that much has changed since 2011, and the latest figures show that there has been a decrease in the number of children living in poverty. George Adam. Yes, the Scottish Government has achieved so much with the limited powers of the devolved settlement. But we have to go further. As the Cabinet Secretary has already said, by 2020, we will have more Scottish children living in poverty because of UK welfare reforms. And this is before the next round of cuts due in 2017-18. It's unacceptable that due to the decisions of the UK Government, children and families in Scotland are suffer suffering. This is why the Scottish Government's submission to the Scott Smith Commission for more power sets out the need for Scotland to have full responsibility over welfare powers. The Scottish Government Child Poverty Strategy expresses their commitment to focus on the need to tackle the long-term drivers of poverty through early intervention, prevention, partnership and holistic services. 
Full powers over welfare and social policy will allow us to tackle child poverty, poverty and allow Scotland to become the fairer country that we all want it to be. Full responsibility over tax and national insurance will help us create jobs and build a more prosperous Scotland that is necessary to support our ambitions for a fairer society. And during the referendum debate, and I said it again yesterday during the Smith Commission debate, some of the best debates were on the country that we all wanted Scotland to be when we were out in our communities debating at various hustings. We set aside, we disagreed on how we got there, but we actually all more or less wanted the same thing. And as I said during that debate, these types of transformational changes that the Scottish electorate voted for in September. So we, I would ask colleagues in opposition benches to be serious about the Smith Commission and make sure that we, they take this into account during the Commission's deliberations because we must ensure that this Parliament receives the powers that it needs. The Scottish Government has also legislated to, for access for education. Access to education should always be based on the ability to learn, not the ability of the size of the wallet of the individual family. The Scottish Government removed tuition fees, saving over 120,000 students studying in Scotland up to £27,000, compared with the cost of studying for a degree in England. Research from the Scottish Parliament Information Centre found that since fees rose to £9,000 three years ago, the cost to students in the rest of the UK £14 billion and Scottish students studying in Scottish universities saved a billion. We also have the situation where various universities are now working towards to trying to ensure that they have access from 20%, at least 20% of people from the poorest backgrounds. And I know UWS and Paisley has actually been hit in, in excess of that figure. And I agree that retention of these individuals is the situation. Yes, Mr. Ken McIntosh. McIntosh. Uh, can, can I thank, thank Mr Adam, and I welcome some of the steps that the Scottish Government have taken, but does he, could he ask me this, why does Scotland have the lowest percentage of university entrants from the poorest backgrounds and the lowest proportion of entrants from state schools in the whole of the UK? George Adam. Well, Mr McIntosh, that's why we have the legislation to ensure that we can actually attain that and make sure that universities move towards uh, getting the figures that we all want. But currently we find that the Office of National Statistics say that Scotland has the best education, educated population in Europe and among the best in the world. Surely this is an example of things that have actually been working for the Scottish Government in with the limited powers. So closing, presiding officer, I, to I would say to close. that the answer to this issue is far more complicated than what the Tories are claiming. The Scottish Government has achieved so much in educational attainment, but there is still much to do dealing with poverty, and in particular child poverty. This Parliament needs the powers to make the type of transformational change we all want. The challenge to us all is to ensure that the Smith Commission delivers the type of powers that can make that change. That's the type of change that Scotland voted for in September. Gordon Brown was claiming the proposals put forward by him and some of his colleagues with the vow was federalism. I'm We're going to be to within a year or two as close to a federal state as you can in a country where one nation is 85% of the population. Mr Adam, you have to close now, please. In closing, presiding officer, promises and vows are not enough. This parliament has to deliver. I'm afraid there is no extra time in the debate. Can I reiterate that? Jane Baxter to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, presiding officer. I'm pleased to participate in this debate, which provides the entire chamber with the opportunity to explore issues which have been the focus of much of the work of the Education and Culture Committee over these past few months. What has been clear from the committee's work, particularly in considering the impact of the Curriculum for Excellence and the recent exam results, is that the variation in attainment of pupils across Scotland is still so marked. And I welcome that the Conservative motion before us does note that point. And whilst the motion refers to attainment, the meeting of a standard, I believe that we should also consider the achievement involved in reaching that standard. These two words are sometimes used interchangeably, but in this context, they are not the same thing. And in saying that, I'm not ignoring the importance of attainment or the role that meeting standards plays in enabling young people to progress in their learning or their employment. But for too many children and young people, achievement or progress towards the standards required means a longer journey than for others. It means overcoming barriers relating to their own or their family's personal, domestic, financial or social circumstances. And it, it is by supporting these families and their children to overcome those barriers and make that achievement which will improve the attainment levels. And while we deviate across the Chamber in our views on how we best close that attainment gap, it's clear that we, we are united in the need to tackle it. Because, as we have heard, the figures are stark. 
As the Social Mobility and Child Poverty Commission have highlighted in a recently published State of the Nation report, those young people from the poorest areas in Scotland are four times more likely not to be in a positive destination on leaving school than their more advantaged peers. And the attainment gap is not just apparent as a child progresses to maturity and on to post-school destinations. The inequalities which exist between children, including not language and number skills, which form a huge part of the overall learning journey, start from day one. During the discussions around the Children and Young People Bill, many members will recall that there was a broad and vocal coalition of organisations who urged for greater support and recognition of the developmental importance of the earliest years of a child's life, a fact illustrated by a 13-month and 10-month gap in vocabulary and problem-solving ability between children from the highest and lowest socio-economic backgrounds. Attainment and inequality also persists in affecting the outcomes of children with additional support needs, with hearing-impaired pupils being ten times more likely to leave school with no qualifications than pupils without additional support needs. And what is clear is that the gap is also widening. And returning to the work of the committee, the evidence from all the teaching unions during the inquiry, inquiry into Curriculum for Excellence was unanimous in presenting the increased burden faced by teachers in delivering the new national qualifications. The EIS found from the Rome Workforce Survey that over 80% of respondents found the workload of the new system a cause for severe stress. So when teachers are focusing their energy on navigating the system, as well as being able to teach, then there's clearly a problem. And I do hope and I believe the Cabinet Secretary will take on board the challenges being faced by pupils, teachers and schools under the new national qualifications. There is broad support for Curriculum for Excellence, but we must make sure that it's fit for purpose. I have said before, and I say it again, it is disappointing if what the figures suggest are true, that still for too many children in Scotland, your life chances will be determined by those circumstances which you are born into, and not your potential to achieve, develop and thrive. This Parliament can rightly be proud of some of the steps it has taken in the past few months to improve the opportunities for care leavers and looked after and vulnerable children, but it is important that we do not stop now. For nearly 80% of looked after young people leave school at 16, with an average attainment nearly four times lower than their non looked after peers, and they are seven times more likely to have been excluded. Colleagues, we are still failing an entire generation. Bernardo's have been keen to highlight the challenges facing those looked after young people who remain in the home environment. Although similar in number to those looked after people in, young people in foster care, for too many looked after children at home, there is not the same level of support. It will be interesting to see whether public bodies rise to the challenge of their new duties under the Children and Young People Act of supporting looked after children and take steps to specifically help close the attainment gap which marks the life chances of too many young people. But schools cannot be expected to effectively tackle the attainment gap on their own. For many pupils, their performance at school is intricately bound up in a web of other challenges, whether at home or in their wider community. And for just as many pupils, a quality learning experience and the boost to aspiration and ambition which that can bring is just as likely to take, part, to take place outside the classroom as inside it. Sport, youth clubs and after-school activities can all have a hugely beneficial effect on a child's outcomes through experiential learning and confidence building. Which is why we should look to the impact of health and social care integration, which although focused on older people, brings with it consequent changes which are emerging in children's services. This, combined with the requirement for a child's plan, offers the potential for everyone involved in meeting a child's emotional and learning needs to work in partnership with the child as the focus. So, presiding officer, in summing up, I make reference to Labour's amendment and reiterate the importance of identifying the barriers to learning facing all children and young people and making sure that the child is at the focus of the support which is available. Thank you. Many thanks. Stuart Stevenson, to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The uh, Conservative motion before us today says they, and I quote, believe in greater diversity in schools. Now, the Collins uh, Dictionary defines diversity as the relation between entities when numerically distinct. In other words, there have to be a multiplicity of entity, entities. Now, in my constituency in the council area of Murray, the future of schools in Fenechte, Port Noki, Port Essie, Cullen, Rothy Mai, Crossroads and Clooney School and nearby at Port Gordon and New Mill are all under review. And Milnes High School in Fochabers and Moss Turdloch is under threat of closure. 
The Tory motion also believes in maximum choice. Are schools in Murray with good educational attainment being supported by what's proposed? No, they're threatened by proposals to merge, to close, to reduce the number of schools. Reducing diversity, reducing choice, not to deliver maximum choice, but quite the opposite, not to deliver greater diversity and reduced numbers. I may come to Mary Scanlon later, because I will say things of considerable interest to her. No educational case has been made for the changes uh, that are proposed in Murray. Nor does the economic case stand any scrutiny, because many of these schools are below the 70 pupils level at which additional funding trips in. And if the schools that are proposed for closure were to close, it will be a seven-figure sum in funding that Murray Council sacrifices. So it's not justified in diversity, it's not justified in choice, and it's hardly likely to be justified on economic grounds. But more fundamentally, there is not a squeak, not a sound, not a word of community uh, wanting this kind of change to be made. Now, how do we know what the community thinks? Well, on Saturday, the communities in Fochabers and Moss Todloch in uh, my colleague Richard Lockhead's constituency were on the march to save their local uh, high school, Milnes High School. An excellent school, as many of the schools I've referred to are, with good marks. We're not looking at closing failing schools here. We're looking at schools with good educational records. So on, just wait please if I may, presiding officer. So we had a community energized in defense of its own school. Not quite unanimously though. The local conservative councillor, well known to Mary Scanlon, was not with the team in Fochabers in Moss Todlock. He was not standing shoulder to shoulder with his constituents. He was standing on the touchline at Easter Road as an assistant referee between Hearts and Hibs. A very important job, very important that he gives that support in the capacity he does. But on that day of all days, he should have been standing shoulder to shoulder uh, with his constituents, and I hope uh, that in future he will do so. Does Mary Scanlon wish to comment? Mary Scanlon. Uh, thank you. I do think, uh, presiding officer, it is inappropriate to talk about a member of my staff who does have a contract with Scottish Football Association, but I would ask Mr Stevenson, as the convener of the Standards Committee, to reflect on his comments. Can I just say that my granddaughter is a pupil at Ms Dodlog School, and I want to declare that as an interest. The only proposals to close Milnes are from Caledonia Consulting, and I'm sure as a member of the SNP, uh, the member will be aware that Can all the councillors in Murray Council will be voting on Monday to determine whether or not that school is up for closure. But I will say I'm on the same page with the attainment levels. I have a paragraph in my closing speech on Milnes High, and I agree very much with the member on the attainment Stuart levels. Stuart Stevenson. Well, can I say I think I'm perhaps maybe encouraged by what I've just heard, but I think equally it sounds as if we may be hearing, presiding officer, an attempt to outsource the blame for something that was initiated by the council. Um, but if on Monday we get the kind of result that the communities have been marching for, then I think that is something I will make common cause with anyone in any part of this chamber and express gratitude for. So I'm glad to have raised it today, to give it that airing in the hope uh, that we may see uh, some progress on behalf of our communities. Now, in the remaining 50 seconds uh, that I have, let me just say a little bit about disadvantage and about from where that comes. Yes, it comes from economic uh, circumstances. It certainly does not come from genetic ones when children are born. Uh, I did uh, an event in uh, Aberdeen, uh, I think in 2009, 2010, as a minister, where I saw a film of a one-year-old child beating with music. Right from the outset of birth, children are affected by the environment. So having an economic environment 
where we're denying children the range of uh, opportunities that they would get in more wealthy environments is not a way forward. And I ask the Tories to reflect on that, ask the Tories to consider the effects on next generations of economic policies uh, coming from Westminster, and I'm happy to support the Cabinet Secretary's amendment. Presiding Officer. Many thanks. Liam MacArthur, to be followed by Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I, uh, like others, welcome uh, today's debate and thank Liz Smith for bringing it. I listened to the exchanges between herself and the Cabinet Secretary earlier on. It was observed, maybe, save the children's uh, analysis and recognising that while our education system serves the majority of our children well, though no room for complacency, it is still failing too many uh, of our poorest uh, children. Neil Bibby's amendment focusing on improved um, provisions, uh, preschool provisions and the needs particularly of looked after children is a one I wholeheartedly support indeed reflect uh, my own uh, amendment for this debate. But the government's amendment is the usual disappointing mix of self-congratulation mixed with Westminster bashing. There is undoubtedly much to be proud of in terms of what we are doing here in Scotland. Mr Russell highlighted a number of examples of remarkable work being done by staff, pupils and others in schools right across Scotland. In part, this, I think, reflects the commitment to this issue shown by successive administrations, by MSPs across the polit political spectrum, as well as the work being done directly by those involved in the sector. The risk, however, in the SNP claiming credit for anything positive and blaming everything else on Westminster is that it absolves Scottish ministers and indeed this parliament of taking action where action is possible and necessary. This point was made by the Children's Commissioner in evidence to the Education Committee earlier this week. While reiterating the central importance of child poverty to issues of child, uh, child attainment, Tam Bailey also made clear that there are things the Scottish Government could be doing that would make a difference. Targeting resources where they are most needed is perhaps the clearest example. Where Scottish ministers have been reluctant to act, preferring instead to blame Westminster for an overall lack of resources, despite being in a position no different from any other part of the UK. Interestingly, this was a point picked up by the Social Mobility and uh, Child Poverty Commission uh, in their report published earlier this month. While extremely positive about the Early Years Collaborative and the joint working and understanding uh, that that facilitates, the report observed that programmes, quote, do not focus specifically on pupils from disadvantaged households in their project conception, design and evaluation. They go on to say it is particularly worrying that these programmes do not use any data to target effectively. That criticism about a lack of transparent data was interesting. It chimes with a concern that the Education Committee, in the context of very extensive work we've carried out since 2011 on attainment and achievement for those going through the care system, and, and, and indeed through a more recent consideration of the Children Young People's Bill. Yet, time and again, ministers fall back on condemnation of welfare reforms, which would be fair enough, perhaps, if what the SNP were proposing by way of an alternative were demonstrably different or credible. In truth, they have been neither. After months of SNP ministers and backbenchers railing against the work programme, sanctions and even universal credit, their own Welfare Reform Commission recommended, surprise, surprise, a work programme, sanctions and the principle of universal credit. Meanwhile, the Fiscal Commission called for matching the trajectory of debt reduction. Changing the names but adhering to the principle and offering no new money does not an alternative vision make. So let's please have a little bit more honesty here. Let's also make sure we're doing all we can within the areas of our own responsibility. One such area, of course, is early learning and childcare. Thanks to the case made by the Scottish Liberal Democrats and a range of children's charities over many months, we've seen the Scottish ministers agree to extend free provision to more of Scotland's two-year-olds from disadvantaged backgrounds. One could argue that this is in fact a rare example of effective targeting on those most in need, where for a long time ministers insisted on focusing on the universal provision being made for three and four-year-olds. Welcome though the latter is, it failed to address the benefits of targeting interventions both at children below the age of three and those most in need. I'm going to have to carry on, I'm sorry Mark. One of the strongest advocates of this approach has been Save the Children. They return to it in their briefing for this debate. They point out that the learning gap emerges in the early years, long before children reach school, and becomes difficult, if not impossible, to close. That is why, though I very much welcome the steps taken in the budget back in January, I would urge ministers to go further and match what is in place for two-year-olds from the most disadvantaged backgrounds south of the border. 
The evidence shows that for every pound invested before the age of three, 11 pounds are saved later in life. So as well as helping close the attainment gap, this is a sound investment in the economic and social well-being of this country. Not a bad way, perhaps, uh, for the new First Minister to begin her tenure. Save the Children also call for targeted support in school, quoting targeted initiatives that support pupils living in poverty to catch up quickly if they start school already behind, using a range of measures, including one-to-one -one teaching and parental uh, involvement. This reflects the thinking behind the pupil and premium in place in England, and again something ministers, I think, should be reconsidering to make most effective use of the available resources. Deputy Presiding Officer, the challenge we face in tackling the attainment gap is significant, it's complex and impossible to do justice in the short time available this afternoon. But I'm grateful to Liz Smith for enabling this debate to take place. Proud too, like Jane Baxter, for the work undertaken by the Education Committee during this Parliament and the important progress I think we have helped achieve. Further progress is quite clearly needed and tackling issues of poverty will be you key. Close, but evidence um, suggests it's not necessarily a prerequisite. Save the Children point out some schools and local authorities are achieving great things for the poorest uh, children in their areas, ensuring that their ability to do well in the classroom is not hindered by growing up in low-income households. So there is the basis on which to build, ideas to draw on and how we target resources and hopefully a continued consensus that will allow us to make progress. Thank you. Many thanks. Uh, tight for time today. Up to six minute speeches, please. Kevin Stewart to be followed by Margaret Mitchell. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Over uh, my years as a, an elected member uh, in Aberdeen City Council and since 2011 here, I've had many opportunities uh, to talk to teachers, uh, to parents uh, and to pupils on this and many other issues. Uh, one of the most interesting conversations that I have ever had was with a teacher who I had known for a very long time, who uh, taught at uh, a, a school in a disadvantaged community in Aberdeen um, and spent her final years um, in a school in a, a posher suburb uh, in the city. Um, now, this woman was never uh, backward uh, in coming forward and giving her views. And while she praised many of the initiatives that had taken place uh, instituted by the, the Scottish Government uh, or by the Council, um, she was also uh, very critical of some other things that were taking place in society. Uh, and some of the things which she uh, said uh, were very, very interesting indeed. Uh, one of the things was uh, you can uh, reduce class sizes as much as you like in certain areas, but if the kids are coming to school hungry, they're not going to be able to concentrate and they are not going to be able to learn. You can send in as many PSAs, pupil support assistants, into schools if you like, but if those kids are hungry, they're not going to be able to concentrate, they're not going to be able to learn. She, as a teacher, used to take various snacks into school. Um, and in the morning, we'd hand out cereal bars and fruit in the hope uh, that stomachs would be filled and concentration levels would lie. Some would say that is not a teacher's job. She's seen that as her day and daily work in that school. She then went on to talk about uh, the school that she moved to. Um, because of demand, class sizes in that school were much, much higher. Um, the level of pupil support, much, much less. Attainment levels, higher. Why, presiding officer? Why? Because those kids went to school with full bellies and with very little worries. And beyond that, those schools also had the advantage of parent-teacher associations uh, and uh, parent councils which were able to raise uh, large amounts of money for additional things. Now, uh, presiding officer, I think we have got to take cognizance of the folks who are working at the coalface, who have worked in both disadvantaged and advantaged areas. And when they are saying to us that a lot of the problems that exist are not about education policy, and not even about education resourcing, but about day-to-day -day struggle that certain families 
face in their lives, we have to listen to them. And, you know, Liz Smith mentioned poverty, but in some regards, you know, there's a bit of crocodile tears about this, because what we do know is that we'll, there will be 100,000 children in Scotland, 100,000 additional children in Scotland who will be forced into poverty because of the policies of the current Tory Liberal ex uh, administration at Westminster. I'll take Miss Dugdale. Is there Dugdale? I agree very much with much of what Kevin Stewart has said. I wondered whether he's read the Joseph Rowntree report on tackling the attainment gap in our schools and whether he agrees with them that you should support targeted funding, actually allocating additional resources to schools and nurseries. Um, I, I, as I've sure. said to Ms Dugdale, uh, having been involved at a council level uh, in trying to target resources to disadvantaged areas, um, you know, that has been helpful in some regards, but the social issues, the issues of poverty have held kids back. So in, in reality, you know, we, could, we can continue to cl cut class, class sizes, and I hope we do. We, continue, we can continue to put PSA resource into poorer areas. But the realities are that we're not going to help a lot of these children unless we make sure that they're, uh, uh, they're fed properly and they have the advantages uh, that others do at home. And let me turn to families, because, you know, a lot of poor families sacrifice a huge amount to try and ensure that their kids do well at school. Others wish that they could sacrifice more, but they can't. Uh, and yet, you know, uh, 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 those kids tend to do that bit better. But, you know, the key thing in all of this is maximising the amount of income, whether folk are on welfare or whether they're in work, uh, low paid work, to make sure that they have the ability um, to feed and to care for their children properly and give them the advantages that are required. Gerfec is a great principle, but one of the things which it doesn't take into account is the income that's going into a household and how that affects uh, an individual child. As you on the point, close, please. Uh, last, last point, uh, President Officer, on the point of demonisation of, of individual schools. Having been at a, a school myself which was demonised, uh, we then saw a huge amount of kids move out of that school, a huge amount of teachers move out of that school to other schools, uh, and then that school basically failing. That school is no longer in existence. And I would hate, you must close, absolutely please. hate to see the Tories get their way in this demonisation and the same thing to happen right across this nation. Many thanks. I now call on Margaret Mitchell to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Up to six minutes, please. Presiding officer, the motion highlights the need for greater support for pupils with often hugely varied additional support needs. The failure to ensure this support is available cannot be in doubt, given, for example, the experience of those pupils who are dyslexic. As convener of the cross-party group on dyslexia, I want to pay tribute to the superb work done by the members who are a diverse and accomplished group with a wealth of experience about dyslexia. Amongst other things, through the efforts of the members in Dyslexia Scotland, a dyslexia toolkit has been developed and a definition established which has been approved by the Scottish Government. In almost 10 years since the CPG came into existence, and during this time, it is nothing short of a scandal that the same obstacles continue to prevail for those ASN pupils seeking diagnosis and assessment and trying to secure the necessary support. An analysis of these obstacles reveals some common themes, starting with the discrepancies within as well as between local authorities. This has resulted in a school postcode lottery for ASN pupils seeking appropriate support. Furthermore, this situation is unlikely to improve when, as Liz Smith pointed out, currently schools are answerable and accountable to, first and foremost, local government and national government, rather than to parents and pupils who are best placed to comment. Very quickly, Kathleen Secretary. I share the member's concern with dyslexia. I would point out to the example, I think it is, of Mainholm Academy now that has become a dyslexia-friendly school. Now, that is within the existing structure, but has pioneered an approach which is very important across Scotland. And I'm sure the member will accept the increased funding that has gone to Dyslexia Scotland and the consideration that's being given to giving every bit of help to that model so it does not require to deconstruct Scottish local authorities to change what is taking Margaret place. Mitchell. 
any dyslexia friendly school is of course welcome but let's look in a little bit more detail about just what's happening with this additional funding the cabinet secretary comments on not surprisingly the cross party group continues to hear cases for example about parents who have reason to believe their child is dyslexic having to fight to convince the school that uh, an assessment is essential Educational psychologists carry out the assessments, but with the ever-increasing demands on these psychologies, uh, it is sadly not uncommon for parents to have to pay for an independent assessment for their child who should have been tested in school. And this very def definitely raises equality issues surrounding parents' ability to pay for these independent assessments and is just one concrete example of an area of educational policy that the Scottish Government could address to mitigate inequality. Instead, the Cabinet Secretary's nothing to do with MEGAV response to this problem has been to glibly state the self-evident fact that Education authorities have a responsibility to have an education psychology service and to prioritise and manage the service in light of local circumstances and priorities. Well, I'm sure that inspired and reassured the many anxious parents and pupils fighting to have these assessments. I hope, therefore, the Cabinet Secretary will take on board the findings and rec again, recommendations of Education Scotland's independent review, which the Scottish Government commissioned to assess the experience of dyslexic learners and those with additional support needs within primary, secondary and special schools in Scotland. The CPG has welcomed the report's conclusion, which considers does ac accurately, if depressingly, list the inconsistencies of policies and practices across and within local authorities. For example, in two schools just a few miles apart, the report found that one had an excellent approach on the response to, in response to a potentially dyslexic child, the other a totally inadequate one. More encouragingly, the report states that there has been a significant increase in training about dyslexia at initial teacher training stage. However, it also confirms that a staggering 24% of primary schools in Scotland are not aware of the dyslexia school, uh, toolkit, which was specifically designed to help teachers and others seeking more information about dyslexia. And unbelievably, some local authorities are still trying to agree a definition of dyslexia, despite a definition being agreed by the Scottish Government in January 2009. The report also states that many more pupils are identified as dyslexia, as dyslexic in um, secondary school, compared with those identified in primary um, So, Consequently, many primary school pupils are being denied early intervention and appropriate support, uh, and this could potentially have lifelong aspect, uh, an, a lifelong adverse impact. In fact, the failure to identify dyslexic pupils at any stage of their schooling has been seen to have far-reaching consequences, so it's crucial. The Scottish Government, rather than focusing solely on literacy, must instead recognise and address the wider impact in terms of the health, well-being, self-esteem, confidence, ambition and aspirations of these pupils. As you draw to a close, please. Yeah. The presiding officer, the Scottish Government continues to assert it is committed to, preve uh, to preventative spend. If this really is the case, it must ensure that the early identification assessment and support of young people with additional support needs are sufficiently uh, resourced. These young people deserve and have a right to expect nothing less. Many thanks. I now call on Mark MacDonald to be followed by Anne MacTaggart. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, I, I represent, Presiding Officer, a, a constituency of contrasts. Um, and using some of the statistics that are available from Aberdeen City Council, I'll, I'll outline why that is. Um, if we look at school meal entitlement, which very soon will, will become less of a barometer around uh, areas of deprivation as a result of the very welcome rollout of free school meals that this government will be undertaking. But if we look at that as, a, as an indicator, uh, in Aberdeen City, 15.2% of primary pupils uh, were registered for uh, free school meals um, in 2013, 10.5% uh, of secondary pupils. Within my constituency, um, the two top primary schools in the city for free school entitlement, Bramble Bray at 65.6% and Manor Park at 46.8%. 
Also within my constituency, the two lowest entitlements, uh, Dainston of 1% and Kingswells of 0.2%. In terms of secondary schools, the highest uh, entitlement at Northfield Academy, 27.9%, and also the lowest entitlement, Old Macker Academy, of 2%. Also within my constituency, uh, the Council Ward with uh, the highest child poverty, uh, Northfield Council Ward of 33%, and the Bridge of Dawn Council Ward with less than 5% child poverty. So I represent a constituency of extremes uh, and those extremes uh, lead to the challenges that I referred to uh, in my intervention to Liz Smith because in many of these schools there is fantastic work being done and I would encourage those members who want to visit schools like Bramble Bray, Manor Park and see the work that is being done there by teachers and by pupils on a day and daily basis to do so. But at the same time there are external forces at work which those teachers, those pupils, those families are having to contend with at the same time. Now we see a trend in Aberdeen uh, uh, that mirrors that nationally and increases in positive destinations uh, for pupils as they leave school. 84.6% in 2008, now 91% in 2012 13. But at the same time, that in, that, those figures are not necessarily mirrored across all schools. We see, for example, Northfield Academy positive destinations of 84.4% um, against the Scottish average of 90%. Now, that 84.4%, I think, given what I've spoken about in terms of the deprivation that is experienced within the Northfield community, demonstrates the strong work that is being done there. But obviously, we want to aspire to a situation where more young people are leaving that school to go to a positive destination. And uh, I think one of the other things that, that was interested uh, in, until Margaret Mitchell spoke, um, was that the Tory motion did mention additional support needs, but we didn't hear a huge amount about that in the opening remarks from Liz Smith. I think Margaret Mitchell's comments around dyslexia uh, I was interested by, and one of the organisations that I've met with recently uh, through my involvement in autism uh, is an organisation called Steps to Inclusion. I'm unsure if Margaret Mitchell has met with them, but they're very focused on raising awareness within the teaching profession of autism and dyslexia, what they call the, uh, the hidden disabilities that can affect pupils' performance at school and raising that awareness. And indeed, I have raised with the Minister in the Chamber the prospect of areas such as autism and dyslexia featuring much more strongly within the uh, teacher training uh, that takes place to increase that understanding and awareness that Margaret Mitchell spoke about, to ensure that those uh, are issues that are picked up on earlier. And I don't think that that is uh, necessarily a, a controversial aspiration or an aspiration that need divide the, the chamber. Um, uh, only uh, on Tuesday morning, uh, presiding officer, I, I visited uh, Falkland House School in Fife. I was invited to visit them as a result of some of the issues I'd raised around uh, autistic spectrum disorder and education and saw from my first hand some excellent work being done uh, at that school um, to really advance the educational attainment uh, of those pupils, many of whom uh, had been referred because a mainstream setting was not working for them. Uh, again, I would commend it to those members who have not visited. They say they are always happy to receive visits from members of the Scottish Parliament. They mentioned some of the members who had visited them previously, and I saw a photo on the wall of the Cabinet Secretary with some of the pupils there uh, as well. So I would commend those members who have not yet visited to maybe take that opportunity. They are more than happy to show you around and show you some of the fantastic work that they are doing. At the same time, in my local area, the local council uh, have launched a review on inclusion, and that outcome is being awaited. I'm meeting the council later this week to discuss the findings of that and to see what the implications will be for future uh, additional support needs education in the city of Aberdeen. Another group that Merritt mentioned, presiding officer, are care leavers, and many of us will have met uh, with Alex and Ashley uh, in the garden lobby and got our tartan ribbon for the, for the care, care leavers' tartan, um, but also the work that the Scottish Government did uh, in partnership with Who Cares Scotland to improve and enhance the, the, the rights of, care, uh, of children in care and care leavers, I think will pay, play a huge part towards increasing 
positive destinations. Now, I'd wanted to talk a little bit more about inequality, but I see I'm running out of time. All I would say is that um, the, the one thing that I, th that I found very disappointing, uh, Liz Smith began this debate in response to the Minister by disassociating, disassociating herself from herself, which was welcome nonetheless, but then in her remarks spoke about failing schools. I'm willing to bet she couldn't name a single one because what I see before me is a soundbite that has no substance. And those kind of soundbites without substance are very dangerous Would because they lead to the those? stigma that Kevin Stewart spoke about. And that stigma can be corrosive to the uh, mor mor morale within a school and within a community when they perceive that it is their school that is being singled out by that mention. So I would say to the Tories no, to be very close, careful please. about the language they are bandying about in this chamber and the effect Thank it could have outside much. of it. Now call on Anne McTaggart to be followed by Christian Allard. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am grateful to be given the opportunity to speak in today's debate. As a mother of three, um, all of whom are currently in full-time education, well, I hope they are, um, as I stand here. <laughs> this is of great interest to me. Um, President Officer, I believe that the devolution has brought around some positive change to education and early years. The party's approach to education has sought to both raise the level of achievement through increased public investment and reduce inequality by providing resources for students from less fortunate backgrounds. In the Parliament's first term, Scottish Labour moved significant reforms in, educa in school education. Then it continued its commitment to education by launching a national debate on education in 2002. The debate assessed the future of school education in Scotland and provided an opportunity for policymakers to consider further reforms after those which came before 2002. As a result, there was an agreement to review the school curriculum, end national testing from 5 to 14-year-olds and increase the emphasis on vocational skills and subject choice for 14 to 16-year-olds. The Scottish Labour's second term in this Parliament saw Education Scotland Act 2004 introduced. We see from these examples it is the commitment of Scottish Labour to reform and improve education in Scotland since 1999. We have seen a failure to meet targets since 2007. We have seen a failure to meet targets on childcare provision, class sizes, and free school meals, as mentioned earlier. There has also arguably been a prioritisation of university education at the expense of other areas, demonstrated by the recent cut in college places which is also dear to my heart, and that has been decreased by 37%, which has deprived 140 potential students the opportunity of further education. Although I understand Scotland's devolved education system compares reasonably to those in the rest of the UK and that Scotland continues to succeed, we as a party still have a number of concerns. We are concerned at the lack of comprehensive progress, despite the best efforts of schools, teachers and governments. The high levels of inequality still exist across all areas of the Scottish education system. It is unacceptable that children from poor backgrounds do significantly worse at every stage of learning than other, other children, limiting their potential, future life chances and perpetuating the poverty cycle. The challenge, therefore, is clear, and the key point remains that for schools to fulfil the needs of society, the change in culture and outlook must go beyond the classroom, as colleagues Kevin Stewart and Kezia Dugdale previously stated. It is clear to me what we need to do to continue improving education in Scotland. We should continue to promote social inclusion in families and communities and aim to provide more high-quality childcare to children across Scotland, something on which the Labour Party and Kezia Dugdale has already outlined its, pl its plans. Our commitment to a £45 million investment in childcare places for mothers who wish to take up a college place will aid our most vulnerable and help tackle the high levels of inequality. In conclusion, President Officer, it is my belief that the Scottish Labour Party has played a key role in reforming education in Scotland. And whilst this has been diluted now somewhat, it is my hope that once again we can ensure a better education system for all in the very near future. 
and it is every elected member's responsibility to ensure that that is our priority and it is also at our peril if we don't as children as our children are our country's future many thanks i now call, call on christian allard to be followed by ken mcintosh thank you president officer I too would like to start uh, talking about uh, local schools and talking about the demonization of uh, schools from the Conservative. Um, like uh, Stuart Stevenson, who spoke before me, I can talk about what happened in Aberdeenshire, in rural Aberdeenshire. There, uh, uh, some years ago, in 2010-2011, there were a couple of schools who were uh, targeted for closure, targeted by the Liberal Democrat and Conservative uh, console. There's two schools where Logie Colstone and Clat, and uh, we uh, managed uh, to the community. The communities managed to, to save them. But I can tell you that the month uh, of hurt uh, from the parents, uh, from the pupils, and from the teachers to be demonised month after month, week after weeks. Uh, from uh, the Conservative Party, from the Liberal Democrat, trying to find fault into their schools, trying to claim that the quality of teaching was not good enough, and we heard that again today. Uh, try to claim that the building was not good enough. Try to claim that the, it was the problem was the number of pupils. I can say that that the pupils have grown since. A uh, clat was supposed to be a too smaller. Uh, Logie Colstone was supposed to be a too, uh, too small a clue to survive, uh, has increased by 50% in 2011, and the role uh, increased by 50% again in 2012. So I've learned, President Officer, not to trust uh, the Conservative and the Liberal Democrat coalition when it comes to uh, choices for parents. And today, Liz Miss told us about uh, that to close uh, the item and gap, we should focus on delivering parental choice, greater diversity in schools, and renewed emphasis on improving skills in literacy and numeracy. But she talked about uh, uh, targeting poverty. She said that as well, uh, she, she would focus the coalition, that coalition at Westminster between the Conservative and the Liberal Democrat will focus on tackling poverty. I'm sorry to say that as we see it in the communities I represent the northeast of Scotland, it's not targeting poverty that they do, but it's targeted the poorest in our community. Targeting poverty is not the way to do it with the welfare reform that we have. And I do concur what uh, as Kevin Stewart said before me. You know, children going to school with, uh, with, nothing, uh, with no food is something who shouldn't happen uh, in 2014. And Liz Smith said that uh, the, uh, we don't, didn't like the ideas on, on, uh, on education. Uh, I have to say, we then listen to what happened down south with Michael Gove, what happened to Michael Gove. Nobody likes ideas, the conservative ideas on education. Uh, the, re the reality is that what matters uh, is poverty. And, President Officer, let me quote uh, the report from the Joseph Runtry Foundation. Closing the attendant gap in Scottish education. And the, the report says who you are in Scotland is far more important than what school you attend. And this is at the core of the problem, and it's what we should have been talking about today. Uh, I could stop there, I could uh, to answer the conservation mission, uh, because in fact there is nothing to add. It's all about poverty, but it really comes down to the level of poverty uh, that uh, too many of our young people uh, suffer from. The solution to close the attainment gap is certainly not to give more choice to parents to select the right type of school in the right type of neighbourhood, or to blame our teachers. The solution is for parents to choose a government with a track record of closing the attendant gap and to show the door to Tory politicians like Michael Gove. Let me remind the Chamber that increasing parental choice and ending the one-size-fits-all approach were at the core of the education reforms of Mr Gove down south. This agenda did not work there and it won't work here. President officer, who you are in Scotland is far more important than what, Scot what school you attend. Today, over one in five children lives in poverty. It affects their health, it affects their education, their connection to wider society, and their future prospect for work. 
And yet, we know from the OECD study, the Programme for International Student Assessment, called PISA, uh, that Scotland is in fact narrowing the attainment gap, while the rest of the UK is not. We know that Scotland is above the average of participants in countries in maths, science, and reading. Uh, poverty in Scotland imp impacts adversely on the attainment of too many of our young people, like I said before. But the curriculum for excellence and getting it right for every child are policies that are making a difference in our schools. And there is progress across, across Scotland. But again, presiding officer, who you are in Scotland is far more important than what school you attend. Reducing child poverty, addressing the inequality gap as a keys to close the attaining gap in Scottish education. We can only go so far in mitigating the damage caused by decision taking at Westminster. Children and families in deprived communities in Scotland are suffering. And I should know this, in the rich northeast, a lot of pockets of poverty and a lot of families Could are suffering. Could you close, please? There is, not no, there is no question that we need more powers. We need full responsibility of the welfare and social policy to tackle child poverty. There should be a price on education, Prime uh, Presiding Officer. Thank and you very much. I will vote with the Cabinet Secretary tonight. Thank you. Now I call on Ken McIntosh, to be followed by Gordon MacDonald. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I thank Liz Smith for, uh, too, for bringing forward this afternoon's debate? I can't tell you how pleased and relieved I am to be discussing a subject which doesn't mention constitutional change once. In fact, to be discussing a subject which is entirely devolved and always has been, where if there are any problems, they are at least partly of our own making, and where if there are any solutions, they lie entirely in our own hands. Not only that, I'm pleased that the motion asks us to face up to challenges in our schools, not simply uh, those which have dominated recent political debate around early years in tertiary education. There is, of course, much in our school system to be proud of, not least the achievements of our pupils and the high standards maintained by our teachers and staff. There are political achievements too, uh, and uh, even from the advent of the Scottish Parliament, the first incoming Labour Liberal administration, we moved to restore teachers' pay to rebuild the crumbling school estate. And these achievements, amongst others, have helped underpin the fundamental public confidence that exists in both the quality and the fairness of our comprehensive system, uh, findings that were borne out by our national debate on education. Now, having said all that, the Tories are absolutely right to point out that no matter the undoubted equity of our school system here in Scotland, it does not manage to overcome the inequalities in our society. The OECD finding, findings on Scottish education a few years back still hold true, that despite the best efforts of our best teachers and the fairness of our school system, the most accurate predictor, or rather the key determinant in a child's academic success, is that child's socio-economic background, a point just made by Christian Allard and, and several others. To put it another way, a more tabloid report I heard last month said the chance of a child going to university is directly related to the number of books to be found in their household. Now, I don't think we should be surprised by these findings. Even our school-aged children spend only a fraction of their lives in school. Not just Anne's, by the way, mine too, probably. And they are constantly open to the influence or the obstacles created by family, friends, and often unfortunate circumstances. But we are disappointed by them. We are disappointed that this equitable system of ours does not produce more equitable outcomes. Realistic or not, we set the highest expectations of our schools and our teachers. So what can we do about it? Well, having said that, I have a lot of sympathy for the Tory analysis of the problems or the challenges facing our schools. At first glance, the remedy they propose looks attractive too. After all, who could disagree with increased choice, greater diversity and stronger leadership? Unfortunately, I believe that most of us in, the, in this chamber suspect these words are code. When we hear, Ms Smith, I'm afraid, Conservatives talk about choice, I usually ask myself, choice for whom? Increased choice often only means increased choice for some. Greater diversity, as proposed by the Conservatives certainly in the past, might sometimes be better described as greater division. And the strong leadership and full autonomy for head teachers, uh, Conservatives aspire to, is at the expense of accountability to democratically elected local authorities. In other words, having identified the problems of inequality, the solutions proposed by the Conservatives may inadvertently or otherwise, it may make matters worse. There's certainly little evidence that people in England shared Michael Gove's desire to hark back to some idealistic vision of the 1950s, which frankly never existed. 
and every reason to believe that most people in Scotland would be utterly opposed. Now, don't get me wrong, I do, I do want greater choice and greater parental involvement. We know, in fact, that the more we can involve parents, the better the outcomes for their children. Now, I want to see more choice within the state system, but I recognise the limits of that choice. So I believe in greater plurality. plurality. Far more science schools, far more sports schools, far more music schools, far more drama schools. I believe institutions such as Steiner schools could be part of the state system. And if I thought it ever existed, I too would reject a one-size-fits-all approach. But we have to recognise that some parents are better able to take advantage of the choices that already exist. The answer cannot be a consumerist approach. Schools are not a product on a supermarket shelf. They are a taxpayer-funded investment in our children, both as individuals and as part of society. Our belief in equity and fairness means that, where possible, we want the same range of choices to be available to all. Mr MacDonald. MacDonald. I'm grateful to the member for giving his way. Many um, universities, colleges, uh, even private organisations have partnerships that they develop with schools. Uh, often what you find is that these tend to take place in um, some of the more middle to upper class areas, not deprived communities. Perhaps there's a role there for encouraging more links with deprived schools. Indeed, and to some of the suggestions which I believe the Labour Party are already put, being put, putting forward, and which I hope, I doubt I'll get time to refer to, but I would like to. Uh, and we do need to address the attainment gap between schools, but there's an equally big attainment gap within schools, often for the same socioeconomic reasons, the same list of obstacles and challenges which can hold youngsters back. And I would suggest that one of the weaknesses of the Tory approach is that in creating a pseudo market between schools, that clearly does nothing to address that. So these challenges, this very discussion we're having was one of the key motivating factors in introducing the Curriculum for Excellence. It was designed to get away from that overly strong focus on attainment at too early stage in school and put a far greater emphasis on learning, achievement and self-development. And similarly, I was always a big supporter of the Schools for Ambition programme. As someone who is the son of uh, two head Mr. teachers, George, you may be surprised please. to hear I've come across great school leaders, both the charismatic and the collegiate, and I believe there should be room in the system for that leadership and that individuality to develop the unique ethos of a school community. And most schools now have little or no control over their budget. Uh, but this programme gave key schools £100,000 of their own uh, to, to give them the freedom to do something different, something inspirational. And there is more we can do to remove the barriers to opportunity, the point that uh, Mark was just please. bringing up. Not just in the classroom, but in the extracurricular activities we offer. And my oldest daughter's uh, parent evening, if I may say so, Prime Officer, she had a not, you must close, a hospital please. consultant and a lawyer. That Thank you, Mr McIntosh. That's Thank enough. You. Thank you. Mr MacDonald, to be followed by Murdo Fraser, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Conservative motion begins, the greatest challenge facing Scottish education is the existence of the significant pupil attainment gap between different schools and different communities. However, a 2007 report by the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development indicated that parents' social economic background mattered more for children's attainment than their school. Yesterday at the Education and Culture Committee, we had the opportunity to question Scotland's Commissioner for Children and Young People on his organisation's annual report. On page 8 of the report, it stated, Child poverty is the single most negative factor in too many of our children's lives, and the eradication of it is the single most significant influence in the better realisation of their rights. The report also stated that there is persuasive and disturbing evidence of measurable gaps in social, emotional and cognitive development evident in our youngest children. These are amplified as they grow up. In other words, despite our efforts, remedial actions do not counter the destructive impact on children born into families living in poor conditions. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation report of May 2014 Closing the attainment gap in Scottish education stated that children from low-income households in Scotland do significantly worse at school than those from better-off homes. One of the authors of that report, Sue Ellis of Strathclyde School of Education, said when the report was issued, children who grow up in poverty tend to do less well in education because of factors in their home background. For example, having parents who are more stressed, less able to help them, with their schoolwork. To meet the needs of such children, schools need to dovetail their systems, curriculum and teaching to bridge between home and school so that children living in poverty experience success in education and can use it to lever themselves out of poverty. 
I believe that the Scottish Government has the right policies in place in order that pupils from the poorer backgrounds will increasingly find that success in education in order to lever themselves out of poverty. Scottish Government's Access to Education Fund is specifically aimed at improving the attainment of children growing up in poverty. Schools can apply to the fund to provide support to pupils and their families for school materials, trips, uniforms, IT, coaching and mentoring and parental engagement programmes. The underlying principle being pupils should not have to miss out because they cannot afford other activities that will enhance their learning. In addition, unlike south of the border, the Scottish Government has maintained the education maintenance allowance, supporting young people from the poorest families to remain in education. No thanks. Curriculum for Excellence is about supporting young people to be successful, confident, responsible and effective learners. The Association of Directors of Education in Scotland said about the Curriculum for Excellence in their paper, Raising Attainment and Improving Life Chances in Scotland Schools, that innovative teaching practice, increased collegiate time to discuss standards, increased emphasis on pupil choice and enjoyment, and the radical overhaul of the senior face curriculum are strategies likely to improve educational outcomes for young people. This will build on the trend identified by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation when examining attainment at age 16. They found that the proportion of S4 pupils who had not achieved at least five awards had been reduced by 25% over the five years to 2013. They went on to state that the proportion under attaining fell every year between 2008 and 2013, whereas between 2000 and 2007, the numbers remained fairly constant. In training, the number of new modern apprenticeships has increased to over 25,000, 60 per cent higher than 2006 7 with the Scottish Government committed to increasing that figure further in the future to 30,000. If young people choose to move on to further or higher education, they will find that it is based on the ability to learn, not the ability to pay, saving them the substantial cost of tuition fees. All of this is designed not only to reduce the attainment gap between pupils with different socio-economic backgrounds, but also to have the best educated population in Europe. No thanks. However, we have to recognise that while we are making progress in reducing the attainment gap, we can only go so far in mitigating the damage caused by Westminster policies. The UK Government, by allowing zero-hour contracts, failing to keep the minimum wage in line with inflation and further cuts in welfare will result in an additional 50,000 Scottish children living in poverty by 2020. And this is before the next round of cuts during 2017-18. If the Tories seriously want to tackle the pupil attainment gap in Scotland, then they should accept the evidence from the experts that poverty is the main barrier to attainment. They should also support the Scottish Government's submission to the Smith Commission that Holyrood should have full responsibility over welfare powers in order that this place can tackle the underlying reason for underachievement, which is poverty. Many thanks. And I now call on Murdo Fraser to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I don't think anybody can have failed to notice this is a time of great change in Scottish politics. While the media are concentrating on Labour's search for a new leader, let's not forget the Scottish Government has lost its own First Minister, and we have the impending coronation of Nicola Sturgeon as the next incumbent of that mighty office. I must say it was with some personal disappointment that I heard that Mr Russell had ruled himself out from standing, <laughs> and he must now be contemplating his own future as a long-standing holder of his current Cabinet position which perhaps explains his rather tetchy manner and hysterical tone in the yeah, debate yeah. this afternoon. <laughs> As Liz Smith pointed out earlier, Mr Russell has always had some interesting views on education, many of which we in the Scottish Conservatives would be warm to. In Grasping the Thistle, he praised the Swedish education system of education vouchers, calling for a debate about their utility in Scotland shorn of ideological prejudice. And he went on to say... Choice and diversity are the hallmarks of a mature and confident society, and such a system would ensure the emergence of new types of private provision, which are not seen as exclusive or class-ridden. 
I find it very hard, Deputy Presiding Officer, to disagree with those choice and thoughtful words. And the reality is the Scottish education system does well by the great majority uh, of our pupils. But for a minority, it is not working. And that is not good enough. And we should therefore be open to looking at models from elsewhere to see how standards might be improved for that minority. Now, Ken McIntosh made, a, I thought, a thoughtful contribution. I'm not clear whether it was a, a leadership pitch speech, but perhaps we'll find out in the next 36 <laughs> hours if that is the case. But Ken McIntosh said that choice was all very well, but it favoured the better off. In fact, I take completely the opposite view to that, because our current comprehensive school system could hardly have been better devised if we wanted to deprive those from the poorest backgrounds of the best educational outcomes. Because those from the better off families will always have choice. They can choose to opt out of the state system altogether and purchase uh, education from the independent sector. Or they can choose to purchase a house in the catchment area of a better performing school like Jordan Hill in Glasgow. Or they can choose, as Neil Bibby pointed out, to uh, purchase private tuition, as many uh, parents do. But these choices are only available to those who have the necessary means. The ones without the means do not have the choice at the moment. They are the ones trapped with the schools that are not so well regarded, that they're not performing so well. They are the ones who the current system lets down. Now, I want to concentrate briefly on two aspects this afternoon. First, it's in relation to literacy and numeracy, where the records are simply not as good as they should be. And I'm not going to read out all the statistics, because I'm sure uh, the Minister will be uh, familiar uh, with that. But not enough of our young people, either at uh, primary seven level or at S2, are meeting acceptable standards in literacy uh, and numeracy. And the situation uh, has deteriorated in numeracy uh, over the last two years for which we have uh, records. Now, I don't think it's unreasonable to expect that those leaving primary school should be able to meet basic standards of literacy and numeracy. These are vital life skills for young people trying to get on in the world and uh, find uh, employment or future training opportunities. That so many are failing is an indictment of our current approach. The second aspect I want to address is early intervention. And we've had many debates in this parliament over the years on this topic. And a, there is a whole wealth of evidence that uh, says that intervening with the youngest children is the most effective use of resource when it comes to improving life outcomes. And yet here the Scottish Government's record is patchy. The reality does not match the rhetoric. We've seen a whole range of initiatives from the current Conservative-led government in Westminster focused on early intervention. So we have the pupil premium. So youngsters from disadvantaged backgrounds have additional resources following them through schools. We've seen the extension of nursery places to vulnerable two-year-olds and the introduction of free school meals for those in primaries one to three. And when it comes to those issues, the Scottish Government has in each case been left playing catch-up. Yes, there has been some movement on additional nursery places, but lagging behind what has happened south of the border. And the introduction of free school meals has only happened here because of the initiative taken by Westminster, with the Scottish Government following suit. None of this represents the relentless focus on early intervention that we need to see. And as I said earlier, it is not those from the better off backgrounds with the current system, with, with, uh, with supportive parents who are losing out in the current system. They are always going to do well. It is those from the less well off backgrounds with the greater challenges who need the support and the evidence is that they are not getting it from the current system. That is where a more open and diverse education system would assist. Now we know the Education Secretary has no ideological opposition to this because he's written about it uh, in the past. And indeed we already have some diversity within Scottish education. We have faith schools, we have Catholic schools, we have Gaelic medium education. Why can't we go further? Why can't we have different types of schools, such as more vocational schools as they have in Germany, or specialisms in schools in languages or music or the arts or physical education, playing to the strength of individual pupils instead of a one-size-fits-all approach? Surely it's time, presiding officer, to open up the whole debate about the future of Scottish education, not simply pretend that everything is fine as it currently stands. And surely it's time to recognise, above all, that those failed most by the current Close, system please. are those to whom we have the greatest responsibility. And perhaps, presiding officer, if the current Cabinet Secretary won't tackle the problem, perhaps his successor will. Thank you very much. Um, now call on John Mason to be followed by Cara Hilton.
Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, in preparing for this debate, I thought it would be useful, as one or two others have done, especially Ken McIntosh, to look at some of the things that were actually said in the Conservative motion and see if we can work out what they mean. Uh, now, early on, it mentions the pupil attainment gap, and I think there's been broad agreement uh, through the debate so far that uh, between different schools and different communities, in fact, uh, such gaps do definitely exist. But uh, as others have said, I do wonder if one of the reasons for this wide gap is the income and wealth in our society, and perhaps, perhaps our schools are just reflecting the problems in society, and by creating a more equal society, perhaps that would benefit our schools as well. As, as Murdo Fraser accepts, Richard's families can already move to Newton Mearns or Jordan Hill and get that kind of choice, so perhaps it is no great ex surprise that these schools do do better. And as well, a, which I had written down before, it has been already mentioned this afternoon, the fact that there's extra tu tutor tuition support a, for kids from families who can afford it. And I know the voluntary group in Glasgow who tried to give extra tuition struggled to get a, voluntary tutors. Uh, but it is also worth mentioning the attainment gaps within a particular school. And I think there's been uh, Mark MacDonald, I think, particularly mentioned that. And I certainly have one secondary in my constituency where the head teacher uh, said to me it's really like having two separate schools. Uh, such was the gap within the school. Now, the motion goes on to talk about those from deprived backgrounds being less likely to participate in further and higher education. Yeah, I think the situation is just a little bit more complicated than that, and I think there is something a little bit simplistic about some of the uh, conservative points. Because, for example, we often see girls doing better than boys from similar backgrounds, uh, and there also can be considerable peer and family pressure uh, against higher education, further education, uh, for youngsters who even do have the ability and do sometimes actually have the academic uh, qualifications as well. So I think one of the factors in there is, need it, is widening the horizons for some of our young people and uh, also uh, increasing self-confidence, uh, I think, is a factor uh, as well. Now, the motion talks about removing the barriers, and it has still not been very clear to me, having listened to the debate, exactly what uh, barriers uh, are meant to be. But there are hints in the following sections of what the Conservatives might be looking for. Uh, they mention maxim maximum parental choice, well, I do agree that the parents have the primary responsibility for their kids' education, and that is why ultimately they have the right to homeschool if they choose to do so. But are we only to increase the choice for the richer families? Now, Murdo Fraser effectively criticised that as well, but didn't really come up, eh, as far as I could hear, with a suggestion as to how the any new system was going to improve eh, the lot of people from poorer backgrounds. He mentioned specialisms. We already have that. Uh, and uh, different kinds of schools. Mr. Absolutely, yes. Mr. Fraser. I'm well, to, to, to Mr. Mason for giving away. Perhaps for the sake of clarity, I, sh I, I should uh, explain in more detail. My, my, my point was that if choice is currently only available to those better off, we need to extend that choice to those who don't have the means. That means having more different types of schools and more accessibility for parents from less well off, less well -off backgrounds to access those schools. Well, I, mean, I think, as, as others have said, and I'll say as well, I mean, there are a, a fair variety of schools, certainly within Glasgow, where, where you'd benefit from having the urban community. And uh, I don't really see... I mean, if, is you going to keep one of the families who live in Jordan Hill are not going to get their kid into Jordan Hill, and one of the kids from the East End is going to move to Jordan Hill? I mean, if, if that's what it is, uh, I, I really fail to see how that improves the schools. And certainly I don't see how it improves the school uh, in the East End of Glasgow if it is one of the ones that is struggling. I mean, somebody said everything we think, uh, people think everything is fine. I know nobody who thinks everything is fine. Uh, I think Liz Smith used the word uh, complacent. I know nobody, either in the schools or in here, uh, who is complacent about education. Clearly, there are gaps. But the question is, how do we improve things? And my fear is, as Ken McIntosh, I think, correctly said, and he was slightly more generous to the Conservatives than I might be, because he said it might be inadvertent, eh, but I think it's fairly clear that some of the proposals from the Conservatives would actually make things worse. There is diversity, as has been mentioned. Eh, we have, in Glasgow, we have denominational, non-denominational schools. Eh, we have Gaelic, we have sports emphasis, we have dance. Eh, St Ambrose and Coatbridge, which I have links with, emphasises music. Eh, so we do have a fair bit of 
a variety out there as well. And our party policy is that if there is sufficient demand from parents, then we will publicly fund a, a particular kind of school. And broadly, that's what happened a, with the Gaelic School in Glasgow. And I certainly support the party policy a, in that regard. Equality does not mean all the schools have to be a uniform grey, a, but it does mean they all have to have equally good standards. Now, we see mention of strong leadership and full autonomy for head teachers. And I would just say that strong leadership can come at a variety of levels, not just at the individual school level. I think we can have, and we have had at times, strong leadership at a council level in Glasgow, for example. And we can also have strong leadership eh, at a national level. I think eh, members may not always agree eh, with the Cabinet Secretary, but I think they would say that he does give strong leadership. The emphasis on more autonomy for individual schools has been suggested before, and certainly in my area, eh, when that was discussed at parent councils or parent school boards, there was not a lot of enthusiasm for it. And again, I just feel that that would widen the gap because there is often amongst parents in my area, there is a lack of confidence. Parents often did not have a good experience at secondary school themselves must be closing, and they are therefore wary for taking on more. Eh, so while I normally criticise Glasgow City Council, I do think a lot of good things happen because schools are run at a council level and resources can be moved around. Thank you. Thanks very much. <clears throat> now call on Cara Hilton. Uh, up to six minutes, please. Less would be more. Um, thank you, President Officer. And can I apologise to Liz Smith, who is not here, for missing the start of her speech. Um, I welcome the opportunity to speak in today's debate on educational attainment and in support of Labour's amendment in the name of Neil, Neil Bibby. Across the Chamber, we all share concerns about the continued gap in attainment levels between children from the richest and the poorest households in Scotland, even if we don't quite agree on the solution. It's a gap that begins early in the preschool years and continues and widens as children start school and throughout their school years. And it persists when children leave school and move on into the labour market, into college, university, throughout their lives. It may be 2014, but thousands of our communities uh, thousands of children in our communities right across Scotland continue to be caught up in a cycle of disadvantage from which there is little prospect of escape. At least one in five children live in poverty and this shapes and impacts on every aspect of their life. And here, as Kevin Stewart has already touched on, um, no child will ever achieve their full potential if they turn up to school with an empty belly or if they're living in a damp, overcrowded home. I too have had conversations with teachers who told me that they bring in cereal and snacks for kids in the morning, and that's just simply not acceptable. When teachers tell me that children are turning up at school hungry or without a warm winter coat, when I hear that children living in poverty are three times as likely to suffer mental health problems, then that makes me extremely angry. And I know that my colleagues across the chamber feel the same. But while I've got absolutely no doubt that the coalition government's austerity measures, cuts to tax credits and welfare reforms are all a factor, the gap between the rich and poor in Scotland is deeply entrenched, just as it is across the UK. And we need a more radical solution if we're going to address the persistent poverty and inequality that too many of our children are brought up with. Yes, we do have a good education system here in Scotland, and I don't really agree at all with the Conservative motion or many of the speeches. But the fact is that our education system isn't doing well enough for our most vulnerable children in Scotland, and our attainment gap continues to be wider than in similar countries across the world. Our amendment today talks about a greater focus on literacy and numeracy, and as well in tackling poverty, we need to take different approaches here if we're going to close the gap. According to an EIS report, by the age of three years old, children from deprived backgrounds are already nine months behind the average development and in readiness for school. And by the age of six, low-achieving children from better-off homes start to outperform those initially higher-achieving children for poorer families. By primary seven, that gap in reading attainment levels between pupils in poverty and their better-off peers is 22%. This is a gap that's simply unacceptable, and the fact that it's getting worse is a huge concern and challenge. The gap is starker still when we look, uh, look at, looked after children, and Jane Baxter touched on this earlier. Statistics show that 85% of looked after children leave school by 16, compared to an average of 30%. Just 2% of looked after children go to university. A stark contrast, and given the duty of the Children and Young People's Act to support looked after and formerly looked after young children, I hope that we're going to see fur further action from the Scottish Government to address this huge gap in educational outcomes. In Fife, the, the Labour-led Council has embraced a radical approach to closing the gap, based on early and targeted intervention to support those children and families most in need. By intervening early to, to encourage secure primary attachment between children and their parents, 
through embracing a family nurture approach that meets the needs of children and families from pre-birth to preschool, by providing extensive parent and support programmes and working especially with young mums and dads to build their skills and develop their confidence and self-esteem and by ensuring that those families with extra needs can access the right intervention and support services in a non-stigmatised way, receiving as little or as much support as they need, such as help with drug and al or alcohol issues or with domestic abuse. An approach that is based on developing nurture schools, focused on making all our schools as inclusive as possible for all our children, and also for parents too that have possibly had a bad experience of education when they've been at school. All working together to ensure that young people from more vulnerable backgrounds are fully supported at all stages of their education. I hope that the Nurture School approach will make a real difference in Dunfermline and communities across Fife, and I hope that it's a model that local authorities across Scotland will embrace. Important too is the rights respecting agenda, and across Fife, over 100 schools are taking part in this fantastic UNICEF programme. Uh, I recently had the pleasure of taking part in a recent session in a school in Dunfermline where the children discussed in impressive detail the UN rights of the child, in particular the right not to go hungry. They planned a campaign to encourage donations to the local food bank. One girl even told me that she knew how important food banks were because her family had had to use the food bank in the past. Fife has also embraced the workshop for literacy approach and I visited a number of schools in my constituency to see this work in practice. I was extremely impressed to see the number of learning opportunities that can evolve from just one Katie Morag book, bringing learning to life, capturing the imagination of every single child in the class. And this is an approach that has been adopted in all five schools, and the evidence already shows that it's raising pupils' literacy scores across five. It really is working. So, in conclusion, well, the Conservative motion today paints a bleak picture of what's happening in our schools and a solution that few of us in Scotland want to see. In Fife, real work is happening to raise attainment for our children and our young people. Practical steps which are breaking the cycle of disadvantage for families in Fife. Closing the gap and ensuring that every single child has the opportunity and the support they need to be the best that they can be. Many thanks. And we now move the closing speeches and I call on Kezia Dugdale. Six minutes, please. Thank you very much, President Officer. And can I start by paying tribute to all the teachers, um, support staff and educational staff in our schools uh, across the country. Um, their life's mission is to share knowledge uh, and also to ensure that kids have the best possible start in life. They have that public service duty to do what they can to close the educational gap that we are talking about today, uh, going above and beyond the call of duty all the time. And I know that from having two parents uh, as teachers. Uh, my mum later went into local authority work in an education department and laterally in her career built schools and built nurseries and I remember coming home one day being quite so upset about the extent of the child poverty challenges in Dundee and she was involved in building a nursery there and where and the child poverty in this particular part of Dundee was so extreme that it was common in fact the majority of kids turned up hungry in the morning uh, tired and, and quite often dirty as well and the mission for that uh, nursery school was first and foremost to feed and wash and sleep the kids and only after could they do that that they were in a position to teach those kids to give them the opportunity to learn and she was struggling with the concept of putting fast and power uh, very powerful washing machines into nurseries as standard because it was on the presumption that the kids would need that facility what a damning indictment of the state of child poverty in this country and that very story I think demonstrates how the gap in educational inequality begins and I agree with the SNP that this cannot simply be addressed in the time that a school or a nursery gate opens and then closes again. The Cabinet Secretary is right to talk about the damage that the UK Government's welfare policy is causing, but we are not powerless to act. So we will support the, the SNP motion tonight and do so in the spirit of critical friendship. And can I turn my eyes to the Conservative motion? Um, I was sorry that we didn't hear more from uh, Liz um, today with regards to the issues of parental choice, greater diversity in schools and strong leadership. And I think that's in part because she had to work so hard to defend her government's record on child poverty and her, the damage that her government does with its welfare agenda. And I would like to have heard more about these issues because I would like to have a better understanding of what she means when she raises them. Take, for example, the issue of parental choice. Um, uh, she made a remark with regards to schools around the world 
uh, that do best at education uh, emphasise diversity and choice. Well, I would disagree with that when you look at the example of Finland. I was in Finland earlier this year and there is no such thing as choice in the education system because all of the schools are at the same standard and there isn't a suggestion that you would need to choose because every school has the same merit and the same value. Smith? Uh, I, I thank the member for taking an intervention. Obviously, in Finland, there is a completely different uh, uh, ability to uh, tax the uh, population and therefore there's a very high tax level there. Is that something that the Labour Party would support in order to provide that additional service? Yeah, don't know. It is not entirely to do with tax. In fact, I would say it's everything to do with ethos and the value that you place on leadership and the role that teachers play in schools. For example, teachers in Finland spend less time in a classroom than anywhere else in the world because they're constantly developing their own skills, sharing knowledge and about how to tackle the problems that we are talking about today. So I would say to her, it's not a question of tax. And if she'd like further evidence of that, I'd invite her to go and see what I saw. And I know that the Cabinet Secretary shares a lot of similar views in this regard. On the issue of greater diversity in schools, Again, I would have liked to have heard more from the member on that issue because I'd imagine she's talking about free schools and perhaps she has sympathy with Michael Gove's agenda around that. And there's nothing, nobody on these Labour benches could have any sympathy with that particular agenda. So that's why we're not in a position to support her motion in that regard. I do share sympathy with her on the issue of strong leadership in schools and I welcome the work that the SNP government have done in this regard with their College of Leadership. And I would uh, be willing to debate the issue of whether there is more a need for autonomy for head teachers. But let's take the issue of school budgets, for example. Schools are already in charge of their budgets, but the pressures on those budgets right now mean that there's very little flexibility on them to be able to spend in different ways. And I would say to her, she only needs to look at Highland Council for examples of that today, where they're talking about merging schools, sacking teachers, and having to reduce options of a consequence of some of the financial decisions that this government makes. So it is indeed a very complex picture. Um, I would like to have heard more today about the cost of school, and Anne McTaggart uh, touched on this and used her great sense of humour in so doing, but there's no doubt that 70% of parents say that they have struggled with the cost of school, and I was grateful to Gordon MacDonald for uh, raising the issue of the Access to Education Fund, but there are problems with that, because if he looks at the detail of the criteria, he says he will see that it cannot be used to subsidise costs which should be paid for by a local authority. So that fund exists to fund new initiatives, not to to replace funding which is being cut by local authorities. He should look at the detail of that. Nevertheless, there's a maximum of 300 schools that could access that fund. That's just 8.5% of all schools because of the nature of the criteria. So it's by far uh, getting to the point of the, the problem that we face. I would like to have had the opportunity to say more about care leavers, but there is an issue in particular with regards to moving care leavers from one school to another, especially when they're facing exams. And many people that would have met Alex earlier today in the garden lobby would have heard his first-hand experience of that. So in closing, presiding officer, I welcome the opportunity to debate educational inequality. It is the first time we have done this as a chamber since January 2012. And we have discussed golf more regularly than we have discussed this issue. And I think that's something that we should all reflect on. But in conclusion, what I've heard today, eh, presiding officer, is that the Tories believe inequality is the fault of the SNP's failing education system. And the SNP blame the Tories for the inequality because of the welfare cuts. Scottish Labour thinks that they're both right. Thank you very much. Many thanks. I now call on Cabinet Secretary Mike Russell. Up to eight minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Hey, thank you, presiding officer. And this has been, on the whole, a very positive debate. debate. And I start by uh, saying that Kezia Dugdale was right to acknowledge the role of those who work in education. I'm also a, a child of two teachers. I'm the husband of a head teacher of two schools. I know and uh, have known how hard teachers work, how dedicated they are, and how they have aspired for a better society. Now, I've earned my living in less onerous ways, I have to say, including writing, but I'm delighted that my works are still being well read. I, I think the Scottish Tories and Neil Finlay are my most obsessive readers. Um, and I'm glad because I still get public lending right and it's useful, it's form of income. But I, I, I would really look for more intelligent reading than we've heard today because the Tories are well behind the curve on what has actually happened in Scottish education. Murdo Fraser has underestimated the extent to which choice and diversity are now established in Scottish education. That's what's developed since devolution, first to Labour's policies between 1999 and 2007, building on a tradition of diversity, intensifying it through curriculum for excellence, 
while permitting increased diversity in models such as the specialist music schools, the um, denominational sector, the Gaelic sector, and the private sector that, of course, gets public benefits. And, the, the, of course, the, um, the Petitions Committee is shortly to examine that matter. The great strength of the Scottish education system is that increasingly one size doesn't fit all. There's a national context, there's a local authority frame, framework, and there's local decision-making and delivery. Now, could that develop more? Of course it could develop more. But I agree with Ken McIntosh, and I never thought I'd say those words, but I agree with Ken McIntosh, if we're going to discuss that, let's do that upfront and straight and honestly, and not by the Trojan horse of emotion that we've had today. For example, the historic compromises within the system actually arise from the 1918 Education Act and the way in which that has been built on. And there are lots of models that we could look at elsewhere. Vouchers, for example, have been abandoned in Sweden because they were too bureaucratically complex. Free schools have created also many, many problems for the Swedish system, Although, and they're now beginning to create those problems for the English system. Can I just, and I'll let the member in, can I just point out that Scotland now exceeds Sweden in its PISA scores? Liz Smith. Uh, your book. And I'm interested in the journey that you've taken philosophically from the time that you wrote the book uh, to a situation now where you seem to be moving uh, away from the fact that you liked the idea then that the money which is available through the state per child could be used for that extra parental choice. Have you changed your mind on that? Look, I cannot see, and I have had the experience of five years as Education Secretary, and I'm sorry that Murdo Fraser thinks that I am a burnt-out volcano, to quote a, a 19th century uh, English politician. I still feel that I am erupting all over the place, to tell you the place, and I'm happy to go on doing so. But I, I have to say, I have to say that I don't see how that system could work within what we have inherited in Scotland at this time, but I can see that the diversity has grown and developed. Now, I do want to focus on some of the things that have been said here, but the most important thing I can do in the time available to me is a bit of myth-busting, because we had quite a lot of myths we heard this afternoon, and we need to remove them, uh, or at least correct them, on the record. And the first of those is it's absolutely important that Liz Smith understands, presiding officer, how Scottish schools work why we don't have failing schools, because we don't allow schools to fail. Continuous self-evaluation improvement is the ethos of the system built largely since devolution by successive education ministers. Sam Galbraith, and I pay tribute to him, I think this is the first education debate we've had since he died. Jack McConnell, Cathy Jemison, Peter Peacock, Hugh Henry, Fiona Hislop and myself have all been agreeable to the idea of continuous self-evaluation for schools and a system that, when it intervenes, ensures that correction takes place there and then. When you read inspection reports, you see the report saying that the inspectors will come back at a certain stage. Schools are not abandoned in those circumstances, so that schools are not allowed to fail. There's also the myth, I have to say, that school leavers have no place to go. And I'm glad uh, Liz Smith has corrected the Mail on Sunday. I look forward to reading that correction next week. I shall buy the paper just to see if it's there. But the fact is that 81.2% of school leavers from the 20% poorest areas sustained a positive destination. Could we do better? Yes, we could. But it is not true that those from the poorest locations do not have positive destinations. The figures tell you that. And I, I was very keen to agree with Neil Bibby about looked after children because I've been strongly engaged in that issue ever since I came into this parliament. And I don't believe we did nearly enough. But we also have to say, if you look at positive destinations, progress is being made. 44% in 2009-10, that was poor, very poor, but it was better than some years earlier. 2012-13, 74%. And we are moving on. But I welcome the support of the chamber to make even more effect there. And when, uh, yes, of course. Kezia Dugdale. In the spirit of consensus, I would very much welcome what the Cabinet Secretary has just said. I wonder, though, if you could comment on that specific issue about giving care leavers a right to remain within a particular school, because that's a sort of collateral damage that very often um, means they can't achieve the results they need to. 
I, I believe that that is an important issue and I'm very open to discussing it, just as I am very open to the point that Kezia Dugdale made in one of her interventions about targeting resources. We are targeting resources in the two-year-olds policy. We are targeting in the, insofar as we can as we expand early years education. But one of the issues about targeting resources that the Chamber needs to recognise is that when you have a budget that's under substantial pressure, and when you have increasing costs, where do you take money from in order to create new opportunities? That is a discussion we can have during the budget. Now, I do want to, to make the point to Margaret Mitchell, and it's the only negative point I'm going to make, that I did think her contribution was inappropriate. The issue of dyslexia is vitally important. She's the chair of the cross-party group. It's really important that that is discussed in the context in which there is an acknowledgement of all the partners taking part in the process. I'm afraid what it became was an argument for radical political change. Now, she's entitled to that as a Tory MSP, but as the chair of the cross let me, if the member allows me to finish, as the chair of the cross party group, I would have expected an acknowledgement of the work that is being done by Dyslexia Scotland and by the Scottish Government and by schools to tackle this exceptionally important point. I give way. Margaret Mitchell. Uh, clearly, the, the Cabinet Secretary wasn't listening to the main point of the speech, which is these dyslexic children are not getting the assessments, they're not being identified through a lack, mainly of uh, educational psychologists. And he's washed his hands of that completely. There's something he could do, something positive to help inequality that he says he's so, so passionate about. We have it. Um, she exactly. has, a, a presiding officer, condemned herself from her own mouth. Instead of taking the position of arguing constructively for change, She's using it to make those political points. That's unacceptable, and it's unacceptable for her as the chair of a cross-party group. Finally, presiding officer, let me say this. John Mason said quite rightly that there's no room for complacency, and I utterly agree. You can't be complacent if you visit as many schools as I do, because you see in every school diversity of provision, close, every please. school with ambition. And I would, do, would want to carry this forward with the support of the opposition. Presiding officer, in concluding, I like the phrase that Kezia Dugdale used about critical friendship in supporting educational change. If that's the tone that's been taken, then I'm desperate to work with people. But I'm determined to make a difference of attainment, no matter what. Many thanks. And I'll call on Mary Scanlon. You have until five o'clock, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and uh, I'm very pleased to close this debate. And I would like to thank all, all of those who contributed positively and constructively to this uh, critical issue. Uh, I, I have to say I was sorry to hear Mike Russell's uh, speech. I had actually hoped for uh, something more positive. Um, and as the Cabinet Secretary for Education, I did think he was just protesting a little bit too much. And uh, I would like to remind him that Tories are always looking for good value for money and looking for a bargain. And given that your book is 50 pence in bargain books, uh, <laughs> ma many, of us, many of us have been uh, pick it, picking it up quite recently and reading it avidly. Um, but I would also like to thank Mr Russell. Uh, when I was appointed as education spokesman earlier this year, he did invite me to his office to talk about education issues. And I welcome that because I, although I was a lecturer for 20 years before coming into the Parliament, it was my first role uh, in education. So whilst I sat below the glowing portrait of Mr Russell, uh, he did... <laughs> give me his time and he gave me advice which I very much welcomed. He advised me uh, to meet with leading figures in Scottish education but the main thing that he advised me about which I've never forgotten was that one of the main critical issues in education was the attainment gap. And I also, uh, the final point that Mr Russell made, presiding officer, is that he's very happy to work with other parties uh, to, uh, to improve the attainment gap and uh, I would like to remind him of uh, page 225 in Grasping the Thistle and I quote, the SNP needs to recognise uh, and give up its outmoded prejudice against talking with the Tories. Well, here we are, here we are. I'm always waiting and I'm even willing to tolerate and to view that portrait through all these future meetings. Uh, and and I, do, I do look forward to that, of course. Cabinet well, Secretary. I'm always happy to talk with Mary Scanlon. She is the acceptable face of the Tories. <laughs> and a, unlike the ones who are sitting immediately behind her. And secondly, 
I am very happy to gift her this portrait, as she seems so keen on it. <laughs> really, Scanlon? It's just that I can't afford your book at 50 pence, and I have to borrow it from Liz Smith, you see. <laughs> Um, but uh, uh, on, on, the, on the point of this, uh, uh, this debate today, I do actually welcome the Labour Party because every single contribution from that party welcomed the debate and acknowledged that more can be done. They focused on the critical early years, and I would say that, you know, given time constraints, we've not all had time to do that. And I think often we look at primary, secondary, further education and higher education, and the more I read in this job that I'm doing, the more I appreciate that it's the early years that counts. And I commend everyone who mentioned uh, the difference uh, a good nursery education can make prior to school. Uh, and whilst I'm talking about this, I think we should all value the childcare workers in Scotland who now have to be qualified they have to be registered with the Scottish Social Services Council. They are accountable to the care inspectorate. And they do a brilliant job yeah. for children prior to going to school. And can I just say, most of them are actually on the minimum wage. Never mind the living wage, the minimum wage. So whilst we talk about teachers, can we maybe just not forget the excellent job that they all do. Jane Baxter on Looked After Children, Anne McTaggart and Ken McIntosh. I know he was cut off at extracurricular activities, but it is identified as being one of the many issues that can help uh, opportunities for future. So despite our different political ideologies, I thank the Labour Party for acknowledging the challenges that we do face. Uh, Liam MacArthur, very measured and considered, and again, on uh, the early years and uh, for each pound invested before the age of three, it can save £11 later in life. Margaret Mitchell on dyslexia and uh, for her commitment to chairing the cross-party group on dyslexia over many, many years. I actually thought that Mark Macdonald made some very good points also on additional support needs and I hope that hasn't been detrimental to any ministerial prospects in the pending reshuffle that may be coming his way. Uh, Stuart Stevenson. Um, to Stuart, I would say perhaps he should check how many of the SNP Murray councillors were on the education steering group who were responsible for the review of the school estate in Murray prior to speaking in this parliament. And when it comes to local authorities looking at the school estate, Perhaps we have more in common, Mr Stevenson, than you realise, because I agree with you that it's not enough just to focus on pupil numbers, particularly in rural areas. And a good example of that is Milnes High School in Falkabers, which was recommended for closure by consultants, but those consultants failed to pay any attention to the school's excellent attainment levels, which compare very favourably, as the, the member said, with other schools in Murray and virtual comparators uh, across, uh, across Scotland. Uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> um, I, like others, I would also like to commend the excellent work done by teachers and support staff across Scotland for their commitment and dedication to pupils from all backgrounds, every day of the week. And the one thing I do notice, particularly in the recent referendum debate, is the political knowledge that I certainly didn't know at school. It's the knowledge of the environment, and it's also the knowledge and confidence that young children have uh, in a partnership with teachers that was probably uh, not there uh, many years ago. But as Liz, said, um, Liz Smith said in uh, S4, fewer than 20% of most disadvantaged uh, pupils attain five uh, standard grade passes, while 60% of the more affluent peers do. So this is neither fair and nor, nor is it sustainable. It cannot be the case that a child's postcode determines their educational attainment. And I think that that's something we can all agree on. We may disagree on the solutions. Uh, we may disagree on a way forward. But I'm also very pleased that under the convenership of Stuart Maxwell, that the Education Committee is to spend time and energy looking at commitment, and that's an opportunity for across the Chamber for all parties to look at the issue that we've been looking at today. 
But good attainment at schools is not only directly linked to the opportunities available to young people when they leave school, but to the well-being and the quality of life in future. And as others have said, there has been an increase in the number of school leavers entering positive destinations and uh, remaining these in the last few years. This is very, very welcome. The increase in those entering employment, which was a positive destination, has also increased in the last two years. And I would say that's in no small part due to the UK's uh, policy in uh, the strong recovery from the recession. The UK has had the biggest growth of employment within the G7. The uh, Scottish economy grew by almost 1%, and employment has increased from 73 to 739 in the second quarter of this year. And young people's unemployment is now at a six-year low. So the link between a strong economy and providing opportunities cannot be disputed. And I think one of the main things that we should look at today is that children in workless households in Scotland has fallen again yep. and is now lower than the rest of the United Kingdom. In fact, down 38,000 in the past year. Given that I've got one minute left, I'll just move over. Uh, I just wanted to say something um, consensual to finish today, although I appreciate that there has been a fair degree of consensus over this issue from uh, some people. But I think the one issue we can all agree with is Ian Wood's commission for developing Scotland's young workforce. I think it's possibly the most exciting initiative in training and education that I have seen uh, in decades. The focus on preparation for work in schools, the option for vocational education, the reduction of snobbery about everyone has to go to university and respecting people for whatever job they do is absolutely first class. So whilst we all recognise the brilliant work done by teachers in school and childcare staff, I hope we can all agree that every child in Scotland deserves an equal chance in life and that improvements can be made in reducing the attainment gap if we all work together, on, not only on the Education Committee, but across this chamber. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Scanlon. That concludes the debate on addressing the attainment gap in Scottish schools. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 11318 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick or on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 11318. Moved. No member is asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 11318, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of five Parliamentary Bureau motions. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 11334 on amendment to the name, remit and duration of a committee. And motion numbers 11319, 11320, 11322 and 11323 on approval of SNSI's on block. Moved on block. The questions on these motions will be put at decision time to which we now come. There are five questions to be put as a result of today's business. Can I remind members that in relation to today's debate, if the amendment in the name of Michael Russell is agreed to, the amendment in the name of Neil Bibby falls? The question then is amendment number 11304.3 in the name of Michael Russell, which seeks to amend motion number 11304 in the name of Liz Smith on addressing the attainment gap in Scottish schools be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on Amendment Number 11304.3 in the name of Michael Russell is as follows. Yes, 94. No, 18. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed to and the amendment in the name of Neil Bibby Falls. The next question is that Motion Number 11304 in the name of Liz Smith as amended on addressing attainment gap in Scottish schools be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast the votes now. The result of the vote in motion number 11304 in the name of Liz Smith as amended is as follows. Yes, 94. No, 18. There were no abstentions, so the motion as amended is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 11334 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on amendment to the name, remit and duration of a committee be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. Uh, the motion is therefore agreed to. Um, I propose to ask a single question on motion numbers 11319, 11320, 11322 and 11323 on approval of SSIs. If any member objects to a single question being put, please say so now. Nobody objects. So the next question is that motions number 11319, 11320, 11322 and 11323 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick and approval of SSIs be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motions are therefore agreed to. Uh, that ends uh, decision time. Can I just remind members that the reception for Poppy Scotland is in the main hall at six o'clock this evening. Uh, we now move to members' business. Members who are leaving the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.